Good evening and welcome to the Select Board meeting of November 13th, 2018. I'll call the meeting to order at 6.32 p.m. Um, one of our colleagues will be along in a few minutes. Um, just do a quick opening remarks, announcements, and agenda review. Um, several items on the agenda, a couple of timed public hearings. Um, we will take in, in deference to some staff that are here, we may take them in, in a little bit of an accelerated order just to, to get them through. Um, and some other folks, is anyone here for public comment other than for an item on the agenda? And if that's not the case, then we can kind of go into our agenda. Is there anything my colleagues need to mention to me regarding the agenda or anything of that sort? Okay. So if that's the case, um, just to mention, just talking about public hearings, we have one scheduled for 7 p.m. and one for 7.15, so we'll try to, to fit a few things in before that. Um, and I think to begin with, um, we'll start with our first quarter budget update from Ms. Aldrich. Um, so if you'd like to come forward and take us through that, and then uh, we'll go from there. Can you hear me all right? What's that? Can you hear me all right, Mike? Um, this is the first quarter. I'm Sonia Aldrich, the comptroller um, for the town. And this is the first quarter report on our expenditures and our revenues. Since it is the first quarter, it's there's very little to, to talk about on here. Everything is as it should be on, on the first quarter. There's a couple of little things. Um, license, well, not really little things. Our licenses and permits are up quite a bit at this time of year. Um, we've already collected 50.5% of our uh, licenses and permits revenue, and that's due to building and electrical. So we're seeing an uptick in that in the first quarter. Of course, that could be that everyone just came and got their permits at the beginning of the year, so it might level off. But if you're looking at the reports online, which these will be posted online tomorrow morning, um, that's the reason for that increase. Um, there's no anomalies in our expenditures at this time. It's, it's the typical IT. They're expended 53% at this time of year. That's because they pay for all their software licenses up front. Um, employee benefits is, up, is spent at 61%, and that, again, is because we pay our retirement assessment up front in order to save an additional 2%. Our enterprise funds are where they should be, and there's really nothing more to report on this. <laughs> it's no a good news thing. Is good news, I think. Um, are there questions or comments from the board for Ms. Aldrich? It's more interesting through the end of the year. Yes. So there is another item that's under the uh, town manager's report, but it really is the credit to Ms. Aldrich and the um, health insurance team who might, we are suspending our sur surcharge. So do you want to talk a little bit about that, Sonia? Because that's, you know, people might say, what, what does this mean? Um, so as you recall, we went from a, a self-insured program to a fully insured effective July 1. Well, we had some runoff claims that needed to be paid out of our self-insurance fund um, at, at the end of last year, and town meeting voted $2 million of free cash to go towards helping us pay that runoff, and in order to pay back the free cash, we instituted a surcharge. Um, we're suspending that effective December 1st. We've collected six months of surcharge, and our runout claims ended up being about 1.6 million so far. More claims are coming in. This will probably take a whole year or two before all the claims come in. But we ended up with a $1.6 million payment in July. Then we collected six months of surcharge, which is about $840,000 for six months of surcharge. Well, we are collecting it in the process of that. And then Kay's Logar, we kept Kay's Logar on to manage our large claims. 
and file for them, and she's brought in over 850000 so far. So at this point, we don't want to take too much money into the Health Claims Trust Fund because then we're going to have to try to figure out how to give it back to everybody. So we're suspending it at this point to see if we're going to need to continue it in the future. I don't believe we are, but I don't know what, what's out there for claims. So um, she's done a really great job bringing in that money. That's helped a lot. A couple other things happen. We were expecting a much larger run out. We were expecting that people were going to be running to the doctors right up to the last minute with the other, with the other insurance, um, our old insurance, self-insurance. That didn't happen either. So we had a couple good things happen. Is there anything else, Paul? No, just a report that we met with the Health Insurance Employee Insurance Advisory Committee uh, last week and reviewed this with them. Uh, they were, um, it also it was an opportunity to talk about the new health plan and there's some um, little bumps in the road that we're addressing and Maya and Blue Cross were at this meeting as well. Um, but overall, people were satisfied with it. Um, sometimes there's a sticker shock when, there, when you have a deductible and you're not, you're not used to it. It's a new thing for people. I know I felt it and others people felt it. But it's a good, um, it's sort of where the world is at this point in time. And, it's, and I think mostly it's different. The committee also was concerned about um, you know, the lowest wage the low wage employees taking on, having a bigger cost of their paychecks being for health insurance. But they were very pleased to hear about the run out. The other thing about, about the surcharge being suspended, we're not saying it's over because we don't want to say, we want to continue to monitor it. The um, other good news is that this is also a, very, a good, good thing for the um, school department, for the libraries, and for the town because we put in the largest contribution during the surcharge because it's not just a surcharge on employees, it's a surcharge on the employers too. So this will all, these, um, the suspension will help the, th the three entities um, on, their, on our budgets going forward through, during FY19. So. Are there other questions or comments? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Simon. Yeah, the other thing I had been looking at and comparing to last year, just to see. The other thing that I had uh, looked at um, for this year and from last year to see how they compared uh, was the golf course. And uh, at least at this point, is uh, I think we've taken in 26% and a year ago in the equivalent report we had taken in 32% of what we were estimating. Is, there any, is that just weather related anomalies or were there any? Uh, um, with golf it's weather, <coughs> it's um, membership nationwide has been going down so it's. So, so the. Um, so participation and revenues declined. Uh, revenues are down $14,000 from last year and for this quarter and as compared to the same time last year. So we're down 14000 as you pointed out. Uh, what Ms. Bill says is that, it's just that it is the, is the weather, really, that's really dependent. Oddly enough, that when we had the drought, that was one of their strongest years because even though the course was um, totally dry, there was a lot of people able to play golf. Um, one other thing that, that they're looking at, which I can reference a little bit later, uh, is the golf course closed as of um, today. This is the last day for the golf course. And also that um, they're looking at a providing a snow making for a one kilometer uh, cross country track on the golf course. This has been an initiative of um, people in the community who are fundraising to be able to put it on. So that might generate some revenue. Probably won't be a real revenue generator for the LSSC at this point in time but they'll be able to use the facility. Yeah, I did note that you had that in your um, report. You got it so late. <laughs> uh, the uh, thing that I was left wondering when I read that was, uh, given the amount of water that it takes for snow making, um, has that been calculated by our staff over at the DPW? I don't know if they're taking it from the pond or from, I, I'll have to find out where they take the water from actually. Good question. Other questions or comments relative to the first quarter budget update? Do you want to talk about 
but should preview or where she's here. Sure. <laughs> we can do that. Oh, I, I can introduce it. So in your packet is, is a memo from, it, 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 we want to talk a little bit about the budget um, and preview. And so you have three things. You have the, a memo from the select board to me. You have a memo from the finance committee. And you have a memo that, um, that Sonia and I wrote to the departments. And just wanted to give you an update that we have given, you know, followed the directions of the planning, of the uh, select board and the finance committee. Um, there is a calendar that's attached to the finance committees that we will have to update because it has some old dates in it that have not been updated. So we will update that and, and redistrib redistribute that. Um, but people are starting, or we've, uh, one change we have made with departments is we've said they all have to have their budgets in by November 26th, 24th? 20. 20th, whatever the date is. Um, and then we will begin doing our budget hearings during December, right, right after Thanksgiving, and go through the normal process with that. Anything else on? Just that you said this summer, right after Thanksgiving, this winter. Oh, the winter, after the, the weeks right after Thanksgiving. Okay. Still, I just have a quick question you may have already covered. Um, in our yellow folder tonight, we had this 4D budget packet. Was there any difference over what no. was in our hard copy? It's just a, du a duplicate. Great. Just want to make sure I hadn't missed yep. something. Other questions or comments about the the budget preview and the information we received on that. If not, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. No news. Mm -hmm. Or no surprises, I should say. <coughs> so next, I think, uh, because we have, uh, we're not quite to 7 o'clock, which is when our first public hearing is, I think we'll go into, there's a, uh, we're going to licenses, public way, and meter parking reservations. We have an application for a common victor license, Amherst VV uh, LLC, doing business as VV, or I assume it's VV, I'm not sure. Yeah, VV. Correct me. Bubble T, 48 North Pleasant Street, suite number B1, Nick Goo Manager. So I think that's you. Yes. Um, so why don't you take a moment and tell us a little bit about your business and um, take us through your common picture or thing and then I have another thing from him tonight that I'll share out with the with the group and we'll see if we can take care of that as well but we'll talk about the license the license first so we are bubble tea shop so they mainly serve the like the bubble tea as like max the milk and the tea so we have like 57 type of tea so and uh, uh, we are franchise like Franchise store. The headquarters is in the New York. They have over 60, uh, 60 stores in like. So we are franchise. So, uh, so we 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 under the construction. Oh, we're in the construction right now. So it will be at, like expect. We are starting the business at the. Uh, next year the, the beginning of the next year so yeah and i want to apply the uh, parking meter for the for the like dumpster yeah so to that point and i'll share this out with the with the group here that would be your copy mm -hmm. that. i may not have grabbed enough Anyone? if you'll share that over so there was a request today to reserve two parking spaces on at 48 North, 48 North Pleasant Street. Um, starting tomorrow through the 20th, and this is for, for all day for the reservation, correct? Yes. For each of those days? Yes. Okay. Um, so we have two things potentially before us tonight. Um, one is the, just the common victory license, which is we had in our packet we were sort of prepared for and then we have this piece which is a uh allowing for a uh the reservation of two two parking spots uh in front of the, in front of the location um and so do any of my colleagues have questions Thank you. yes Ms. brewer this is the point where we're reminded where the location is well so exactly that's 48 north pleasant it's not as meaningful yeah. to me as it might be so I'm, I'm 
wondering if Mr. Steinberg is looking it up, but I'm going to take a Earth quick moment and yeah, see so, if I so can. So why don't you explain where your built where your business is, uh, what and yeah. what building is your build is your business? Oh, it's under the the workers. The so works, the, the works. So it's at the lower level under the lower the works. level. Yeah, lower level. So on one side the the um, bookstore just opened. Yeah, yes, yes. And it's it's adjacent to that yeah. near near that. Below. Okay. Okay. <coughs> the, the thing I'm going to look up right now is the actual location roughly of, of where those meters are. Not that we can identify them specifically, but um, if they're directly in front of that building, it, the, I, I'm curious as to whether the, 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 the uh, proprietors of the works, if you've spoken to them about having those spots reserved and having a giant uh, dumpster in front of them. Have you spoken with the folks at the works relative to this reservation for a for uh, uh, the spaces? For the, for the dumpster? Right. In other words, if, if you place a dumpster in front of their oh, business, yeah. do they know that yet? Oh. <laughs> I, I didn't ask. That. I, don't, I don't know. I need to ask that. Okay. Yeah. I will ask because we, we have some relationship. Yeah. We, uh, we talked talk before about the business w w when we start. Yeah. Okay. Ms. Kruger, please. Well, um, this request is for tomorrow, and I'm not, I'm not sure we have enough, we're, we're able to act on this given that um, the, the prime location and the other people impacted and um, just concerned. Yeah, so I think as the chair said, this came in this afternoon, and we, we don't have since all the, the, the proprietor was here, we thought, Bring it to your attention. You look like you have a gun. So while that all realistically makes sense, I gotta assume that dumpster's on a truck on its way here. And if it's gonna be installed tomorrow. So I am I am very con I mean we on the one hand, if it was a few days away, I would say I would say let's def let the town manager follow up on our questions, make sure that communication has happened and then he could make the decision. Um, without us as he has done for us on previous occasions for similar things but I'm concerned that if nobody knows it's coming and the truck drops it off as trucks tend to do whenever they get around to showing up um, that it's kind of a moot point so have you ordered the dumpster already or is no this no no I just uh, told them and uh, I, I, I will like when I get the permit I will I will let them know, but I didn't order good, it. Good. Yeah. That's so yeah, because we, we are already on, uh, in the construction, so it's a lot, a lot of like st stuff need to move out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So sooner is better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Actually. Okay. The reason why, a part of why I ask is I'm looking at the the property, and and there are three parking spots directly in front of it. So if that's where we're talking about, that's immediately in front of the front door of the works. They may or may not care. They may be fine with that. I don't know. And I think that's one question. I think the other question is it's right next to the central fire station. Right. Does that, that have any impact on the, on, right. the, on the fire coverage? Um, or is there a better place to, you know, that this could go that would be uh, helpful and useful, right. you know, relative to, because that's the parking spots, mm -hmm. I presume, because those are the only ones right in front of the business. These are all part of the fire central station. fire station. Um, but then again, so, um, <clears throat> Ms. Kruger. Um, there are some spaces um, behind that building for tenants, and there's one reserved for the management or maintenance, whatever. So I don't know if that's been explored or not, but um, since the property owner's collecting rent, maybe they could help solve the problem. A lot of days. Yeah. Happy about this one. Well, next door neighbor is us, the town. Mm -hmm. You know, and that also might be. You know, I don't know if you. I mean, you would have to have a conversation with the with the uh, with the fire chief about whether. Not only for the spots in front of the building, but if in and around that there. So it lot. looks like the property owner. There is a driveway that might be available. Yeah. The property, owner, yeah. Yeah, but be, but that's how people get into those yeah. reserved parking spaces. Right. Right. One right at the end that they right. control that maybe I don't know size fitting dumpster whatever. 
So I think we have, we have two things before us. One is just the, the license, the common victual license, which we could take action on, uh, I think, fairly easily tonight. The question would be then what and how we might want to handle the, the reservation of parking spots, um, you know, to be accommodating as best we can, but also understanding the circumstances in which it sits, which is right in the middle of downtown. Um, but just to sort of take care of a little bit of business, if someone wanted to offer the, the, the motion relative to the common victor license, we could, we could sort of yeah. resolve that yeah. one. I, I can read that one. Yes, um, please. Um, I move to approve a new common victualler's license, Amherst VIV LLC, doing business as Vivi Bubble Tree, 48 North Pleasant Street, Suite B1, for Monday through Sunday, 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. Nick Yu, manager. So the motion is second relative to the license. Is there further discussion? The only thing I'm going to mention is I think in the in the motion in the text that we have I think the LLC actually is Amherst VIVI -I or Vivi. I think it only has VIV, so I think it may need another VIVI. -I. I. It, it needs. Oh, yeah. So it's just a in the, uh, the LLC. The right, the LLC, LLC, the LLC. Got it. Thanks. VIVI. -I -I. So there's that slight correction. I amend my reading. Said <laughs> That's motion. okay. Is there further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? That's unanimous. Um, so I guess it's now back to the question about how we might uh, try to handle the situation relative to the parking reservation. So, Well, it depends. It, um, I would feel comfortable if we um, delegate to the town, authorize the town manager to make the decision. Okay. And if I did that, I would have this motion I move to authorize the town manager to reserve up to two parking spaces for a dumpster on behalf of Nick's Nick Gu for renovations at 48 North Pleasant Street on behalf of uh, Amherst VIVI LLC is is a motion and then that um, authorizes the town manager to reserve up to two parking spaces um, and then uh, he would make the decision as he deems appropriate. I'll second, but then discuss. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. <coughs> share that with and so yes. Well, I guess with with the um, guidance from this board that they be, um, you know, reasonably near the establishment, but the least impact on that area and that uh, looks like um, it's for a whole week and I wonder with construction if with some better planning maybe the number of days could be reduced that seems like oh we'd like it there because we're doing stuff we'll get your demolition on target and get it brief Also, typically we charge for, for metered. We've charged the, the sort of per day rate on yeah. that, so right. more days is more cost. Um, so I don't see us waiving that. And, and we mm. haven't raised that, and that fee should be re-examined on the re-examination of all fees, but that for now it's whatever it was. Right. Ms. Brewer. Could we please um, alter the motion to indicate that it's $10 a day, assuming that any parking meter spaces are used? <coughs> um, I have no problem making that amendment. Uh, Yes, please alter the amendment. You know, <laughs> gave all power to the manager. <laughs> At $10 a day. Got it. Standard. So that's been included in the motion. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? So that's unanimous. So, thank so you to be much. clear, don't order the dumpster until you have agreement from our office that yeah. you can order the dumpster. Yeah, it so can't be placed on a public road until. Yeah, so I will receive an email. Is that yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. We, we will go out and yeah, yeah. meet I'll with the fire chief and look at this, the location. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> All right. Just shy of 7 o'clock still. Um, do we want to take up 
before we get into our public hearings, which are moments away. Uh, we could take up other things under the licenses, public way, and meter parking reservations. So uh, we have consent calendar and annual license renewals if we would like to do those. I move to approve the consent calendar as presented on the consent calendar page attached to the agenda of the select board agenda dated November 13, 2018. Motion and a second. And that lists just two, I believe, consent calendar items. Is that correct? Yes. yes. So is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 So that's unanimous. And then we have annual license renewals if you want to take care of it. I move to approve the renewal of annual licenses for the calendar year 2019 as listed in the annual license renewal table marked 7C on the additional page of the select board agenda of November 13, 2018. Is there a second? There it is. Is there further discussion? It's a fairly lengthy list. I think this is existing businesses doing their paperwork for us. That's helpful. If there's not further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, so that's unanimous as well. So we've taken care of all of section seven, it seems, in our agenda. And so, you know, we're a minute early, according to so. By the time they get settled. So I think it, in the time that it takes for our first hearing, which is at 7 o'clock, which is an all-alcohol license for the campus pub, Keefe Student Center at Amherst College, if you would like to make your way up here, I will find the appropriate legal notice and then read that. Which is public hearing notice. In accordance with the provisions of Chapter 138, Section 12 of the Massachusetts General Laws, the Emmer Select Board will hold a public hearing on November 13, 2018, beginning at 7 p.m. in the town room of the town hall, 4 Boltwood Avenue, Emmer's Mass, to act on the application for a new annual all-alcohol on-premise liquor license for the trustees of Emmer's College, doing business as Schwimm's Pub, Keefe Student Center, 16 Barron Hill Drive, Emmer's College, Emmer's Mass, Joseph Flukiker, manager. The premises in consideration consists of 971 square feet and has four exits. That was on October 15th that that was noticed. And so with that, I think we're actually at seven o'clock, so I will open our public hearing at 7 p.m. And so if you would like to um, although you've come to us a couple of times this fall, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about your, your application for a, a full license and, and uh, sort of how your experience to date has gone with the one day licenses that you've had so far and sort of paint that picture for us a little bit. Sure, um, so my name is Joe Flukiger. I'm the Director of Dining at Amherst College. My name's Ryan Berry. I'm outside legal counsel to the college on this matter. You can speak into, we'll pull the microphone towards you so you can speak into it. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, as the, uh, Mr. Slaughter uh, pointed out, I've, been, I've appeared before the SUC board a couple of times previously. Uh, we've talked uh, at length about uh, this project uh, in an effort to uh, create uh, an environment where students can uh, drink responsibly. We have uh, offered a number of pub nights uh, with light programming, and we've had, um, we've had good success with it. Um, we didn't expected to be uh, <coughs> extremely well attended and, and it hasn't been. We've on average sold about 10 alcoholic beverages per night that we hosted a pub night. Uh, the intention is not to sell a lot of alcohol. The intention is to create an environment where students can model and drink responsibly and be in an environment where that's uh, part of their educational experience. Um, there has been discussion about the impact on the greater community, I don't, I don't perceive that there's an impact on the greater community. In fact, if anything, we feel like this could have, have a positive impact in our community in helping students to understand 
uh, how drinking responsibly uh, is to be a benefit uh, of their, their own as well as uh, in Amherst at large. Um, so we, we, we feel like it's, it's been uh, a successful endeavor and we would like to proceed with the full uh, license as uh, detailed in the notice. So does the, <clears throat> excuse me, does the board have any questions or comments relative to the license? Um, oh, you have a presentation or someone does? There are some slides, yes. Oh, do you want to take us through those first? And sure. Okay, we'll give you an opportunity to do that as well. I okay. can use the clicker? Okay. Uh, so the, for those of you who haven't been into the space before, this is one of the seating areas. We have uh, essentially two seating areas. Um, uh, so 12, uh, 14 seats in this space plus a couple you can't see. Uh, and this is a back room. Uh, all told, I think it's 79 seats uh, for, between both spaces. Um, we also have, we are offering uh, food, uh, so uh, sandwiches and, and other uh, items uh, for people to consume while they're drinking or not drinking. Um, there's a space there for prep. Uh, there's uh, an additional space in the back, uh, rather uh, on the lower level. This is where we keep um, beer and wine uh, secured. It's actually in a cooler that is locked and then it's behind the door that is also locked. Um, and this is a, a essentially like a prep slash cleaning area that is behind uh, the kitchen area. Um, and so I thought uh, was it asked and I thought it was a good idea to bring uh, to offer these images so that people could see the space and you know just try to imagine uh, how it's being utilized. Thank you for that. Sorry. I'll start with the first question just speaking of this space you're talking about having some food available um, and a limited amount of you know, activities to date with the licenses you've had. Had you have you had more patrons in that that were just having dinner and chatting and not drinking alcohol because they might not be of age or, or whatever? What's what's your general sort of turnout been? I'm just curious, mostly. Yeah. yeah so uh, the turnout uh, is generally driven by the type of programming that we're offering. So if we have, uh, like we periodically will have jazz nights, um, that tends to be you know popular. Uh, so we'll have on average like 120 guests. For, for that evening, um, it'll on the, the lighter evenings it's somewhere around 100. Um, we're not seeing a dramatic increase year over year. Um, the uh, total revenue is up about five percent, so it's really pretty much flat year over year. The prices haven't haven't changed much. Um, I think that uh, the space is a it's it's a nicer space where we we did do some painting and other uh, finishes um, this summer. Um, that was actually aside from it was not really part of the uh, the pub per se it's more just to refresh the space and so I, I believe students are enjoying the space uh, regardless of whether there's alcohol involved okay great thank you mr steinberg did you have yeah i just uh as a comment uh just looking here looking here was at the uh campus and community coalition meeting uh last month at the university of massachusetts i very much appreciated your being there and letting everybody in the coalition know what you were planning and sort of you know it's a very different approach than is occurring on the university campus but then it's a different campus um the uh um, so I had a couple of thoughts about it. One is that, um, as you know, uh, this is aimed at, te at reaching students who um, are age 21 and older and have documentation to prove their age and you're um, doing what the law requires and appreciate that. Um, but of course, part of the drinking problem on campuses is I think that we probably know from looking at all campuses is people who are um, under the age of 21 who are trying to obtain alcohol anyway and sometimes uh, are in a more vulnerable age than people who actually are 21. Um, so I, um, I appreciate you being there, I know, but you are from Dining Services and I know that um, if you, um, 
and this is not a condition of the license as much as just an observation because of the um, campus and community coalition connection, could encourage others from um, the college who would be appropriate and who are involved in um, the questions about student alcohol use and the dangers and problems um, and encourage them to participate in some way, I think that would be greatly appreciated and beneficial. I am aware from um, I, the reports that I have received that there are um, occasional and but regular calls to the college for um, problems that are alcohol related um, that require EMT services, which indicates that um, it would be it might be a helpful connection and helpful to have that. So I just wanted since I had the opportunity and you were here to pass that along. Kruger? Well, um, I think similarly to um, our previous review when it was kind of the pilot, um, I, I'm really in favor of the concept and uh, I think Mr. Steinberg's right that, you know, alcohol education, responsible drinking across all of the campuses or any campus is in order, but I don't think that uh, necessarily this establishment alone bears, bears the burden. I think that's uh, probably a different part of campus life in some ways that maybe can be inform each other, but um, I think to pretend that people under 21 aren't already drinking, um, they're not going to be drinking here legally, and I'm pretty confident that that's going to be enforced, but to have a place where there's social activities, programming, um, things to do in the evening on campus, and once you're an adult, that you can have alcohol with with all the rules and requirements that go with that I, I think it's is a good idea and I, I we've seen dry campuses and I don't think dry campuses are necessarily um, overall a benefit to the town so I kind of I like the idea of it the space is appropriate for it and um, we've already had a trial so and it hasn't really changed the nature of the cafe that much from your numbers so um, it's just another Select board colleagues have any questions or comments for the, for the applicant? If not, is there anyone from the public that wishes to offer a uh, comment because it is a public hearing so we get a chance to ask the public at large, which doesn't seem as though anyone's here for that. Um, so if there's not other comment, I would take a motion to close the public hearing on this. So moved. So a motion and a second to close the public hearing. Any further discussion on that? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Uh, Just the public hearing. Aye. Say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? And if not, then the public hearing closes at 710. So now that that public hearing is closed, we can continue our discussion or potentially offer a motion relative to the, to the request. I'll offer the motion and then speak for a second on it. I move to approve a new annual all al <coughs> excuse me. I move to approve a new annual all alcohol license for campus pub Keefe Student Center Amherst College 16 Baird Hill Road Sunday to Wednesday 5 p.m. to 12 a.m. the following day and Thursday to Saturday 5 p.m. to 2 a.m. the following day. Joseph Flukiger, manager. So did we name, it says Campus Pub here, but I think it had Keith. Well, there's the Keith Student Center, but I think the actual. Swamis Pub? Right, in the, in the public <coughs> notice. You reference Schwemmen or someplace. Right, in the public notice, uh, it was doing business as Schwimm's Pub. So I don't know if we need to reference that appropriately in the, in the motion. So I think instead of campus, it should have SCH. What is the name of the establishment? Uh, well, for all intents and purposes, Schwemm's Pub, yes. Schwemm's Pub, okay. So S-C-H-W-E-M-M -M apostrophe S. So 
if that was what was noticed. Yes, Ms. Burrow. So given the legal notice we gave and what was just said, so doing business, Schwem's Pub, Keefe Student Center, so the word campus pub is just disappearing. Right. Okay. Just making sure we don't have multiple pubs here. Technically, is Amherst College the licensee? I believe. The trustees of Amherst College are the licensee. Right. Trustees of Amherst College, right. Yeah. Or the trustee, yeah. It should basically just go back to what the ad copy says, which was which for was? the trustees of Amherst College doing business as Schwem's Pub, Keefe Campus Center, 16 Barrett Hill Road. If we could just pick that up. Road, drive, whatever it is. Yeah, Barrett Hill Drive. I agree to the, those changes in the motion. I'm fine just with that. And that I just wanted to um, kind of what uh, Ms. Kruger already said is that, um, you know, I think that this is um, something that I appreciate you're doing, and I think that it is um, good for the um, campus probably and good for the town um, because it does uh, provide an opportunity for um, entertainment uh, of, of to appeal to a variety of students on campus. and. You know, it appears from the experiment that it was run well, and so I think that it fits in with our goals that we talked about previously. Um, it is range of pro efforts we make, and this is um, seems to be one that's valid and fits into that category. So um, I'm pleased that you're bringing us here. I agree. More um, some technical asides. One is we had a, an item in our yellow folder tonight that indicated that the police department's um, check, that which we just had a lengthy conversation about the other week, um, is still in process, and that's fine. That's happened before. We just it's just that we know it, and we know that the process will work without that having yet been done. But and if there was an issue, it would be brought to our attention, and so we're good with that. Um, determination of good character. It's not just limited to the quarry, but may include the quarry and other items as were discussed at a previous meeting. And then the other thing was I had mentioned at our last meeting, since typically when we look at these floor plans, we might talk about patios, we might talk about flow or storage or egress, but largely we're not the ZBA. And so um, they have always had a role in figuring out the floor plans as well, and helping figure out the hours. So people apply for a certain set of hours, sometimes the hours we would be all right with, the ZBA is not all right with, et cetera. And so I, I appreciate that this is a different scenario because we're at Amherst College, and I know that Mr. Bachman indicated that he'd see if there was anything that needed to be checked associated with that. So I guess since the answer is as we suspected, no, that when ABCC sees this, it will have been through a slightly different process in that it won't have had um, Rob Morris people and the CBA looking at it. So occasionally things bounce because they don't like where the storage is or whatever, and hopefully your attorney is already familiar with that and it doesn't hold things up. But I guess what I'm trying to make clear is that we're not really blessing a floor plan because we don't really have the ability to do that effectively given what we know about the situation so don't blame us is that what I'm saying <laughs> <laughs> looking at the alcohol we're doing right. the best we can is there further discussion hearing none all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed so that's unanimous thank you very much appreciate you working your way through the process with us Timing is just about right. Oh yes, the uh... oh. Okay, thank you. Everybody in town's in the butter, I guess. <laughs> Not quite. So <laughs> just put it on the floor. We'll get it. <laughs> so next on our agenda uh, this evening is another public hearing, and so I will read the the advertisement in the that was placed in the, uh, in the newspaper. 
Public hearing notice. This advertisement constitutes notice in accordance with the provisions of Chapter 166 of the Massachusetts General Laws and any additions thereto or amendments thereof. Application is hereby received for a poll petition and wire locations from Eversource to relocate and or install poles, wires, cables, and fixtures, including the necessary sustaining and protecting fixtures along and across the following public ways. Number one, install hand holes and underground primary beginning approximately 843 feet and 930 feet southerly of center line of University Drive, Amherst Mass 01002, and number two, install underground primary in conduit approximately 595 feet southerly of center line of Amity Street, Amherst Mass 01002. A public hearing will be held by the Amherst Select Board on November 13th, 2018 at 7.15 p.m. in the Town Room Town Hall for Boltwood Avenue, Amherst Mass. This was placed on October 22nd. And so with that, I will open our public hearing relative to the uh, poles and or conduits, I believe it is, uh, at, s check my 718. And so I presume we have someone from every source. Thank you. So if you'll just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, the location, what's going on. We have some uh, materials in our packet, but please share with us what you need to. Um, Nick Kriegel with Eversource. Um, University Drive, we're looking to at a customer's request, extend our underground conduit onto customer property, but we're going through the grass belt, which is town taking. Um, the one property, we already have existing um, electric utilities underground there, so we're putting two splice pits to capture those feeds and then be able to feed the new um, 10,000 square foot mixed use building. And then um, as far as the other one, the, uh, the restaurant, we're just coming out of our existing above ground junction at the um, kind of driveway of the hangar there. And we're gonna, same thing again, underground primary conduits into that restaurant uh, site. Questions relative to this? I guess I just, to get some clarity on it, um, is this work, um, all get done outside of what is the current pavement that is University Drive? So the two handholes would be in between, I guess, the bike path sidewalks on University Drive and the roadway. So there's that small, say, four-foot patch of grass between the two, and the two handholes would be in that location, and then we'd be cutting across the bike paths or the, the two you know, double-lane sidewalks to go into the, the properties. Is there gonna be any effect on uh, the traffic that goes up and down University Drive? As far as vehicle traffic? Yes, vehicle. Ms. Kruger. Um, maybe it was in my packet, but can you just say what a handhold is? So a handhold is, uh, or it's gonna be a splice pit, but it's gonna be a, say, five-foot piece of poly concrete in the ground so it's going to be flush to the ground and that's it's pretty much a, um, a hole in the ground that's going to have a flat cover and we're going to make splices in it to extend our cables onto their property essentially allows you access to a make the connections you need to but also to service them if you need to later yep. right yeah these will all be below grade below grade other questions from the board just note that uh, the superintendent of public works recommends approval of this permit, but uh, he wanted us to remind you that you should make sure you pull a street opening permit from the town before you begin work. Uh, that extreme care should be taken when working around the trees on University Drive. Those are very important trees for the town. And that we prefer that, <coughs> that the trenchless technology be used in terms of putting in. Is that your intention? Um, so the site contractor, the customers, um, Barry Roberts' mm -hmm. crew will be doing all the digging. Um, there's no way to do trenchless excavation as far as installing the handles because obviously we're going to be disturbing ground. There's no trees in that area, but where we do pass cross those bike paths, it does have to be concrete in case, and there's no way to do the trenchless excavation and then concrete in case on top of those because they are high voltage primaries. So that you know small section will have to be dug and then concrete encased. But we will, I, he did give me that um, 
that as well to uh, make sure we do avoid those trees. Follow up. So then for bike riders along the bike path, they're going to, that'll be the, their flow of riding will be interrupted for a piece, period of time, right? I believe you're going to do it in two sections, is that it? Yeah, so we're going to go over to one, you know, the, the one side, shut down the one side, go over it, um, concrete encase it, backfill, and then do the same thing with the other one. So at no point, both lanes will be impacted. And so will the um, bike lanes be restored so it's a smooth surface, or I'm not sure, and how much of it will be restored? Because if you want to come up to the right, to the mic and just share with us, that way they pick up the I don't know if you folks details. remember, but as part of our uh, proposal for this project, uh, the bike lane nearest the road is going to be eliminated when this project is all done. That's where spices are going to be, right out next to the curb. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now we have the inside bike lane shut down so that our trucks don't interfere with the bike riders and we're asking everybody to cross over mm -hmm. and use the outside one. So we do the opposite as we needed to come into the project. And what, what is the timing for repaving that bike path? Is it gonna be done this fall or in the, spring. in the spring? So it'll be rough going for the bikers for a while over this, pat you'll patch it with. Oh yeah, well, this fall it'll be patched. Yeah. But then you're going to redo the entire lane after your project is done. Is that accurate? If we want us to wait till spring to do the replacement of the bike path, mm -hmm. but we will have blacktop yeah. into our project uh, this fall. Mm -hmm. So at that time, we'll patch it up. Okay. So mm -hmm. Thank you. So since you're there, was there anything else you wanted to mention relative to this project as far no, as? We're, we're moving. Uh, we. Uh, have obtained a foundation permit for the residential site. Uh, so we'll be starting, well, we started on that today, even though it rained very hard. Uh, we have a uh, permit from the town for enclosing the restaurant site. So now we'll start on that right away too. So if it ever stopped raining. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Thank you. Other questions or comments relative to this? If not, I think we can probably take a motion to close the public hearing and then we can take I move to close the public hearing second all right, so a motion and a second is there further discussion hearing none all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. and so the hearing is closed at 724 <coughs> and so I would take a motion if you would. Sure, I'll, um, we can still discuss um, I move to approve the addition of hand holes and electrical con maybe I should say two handholds, an electrical conduit by Eversource on University Drive to meet the needs of a new commercial property at 70 University Drive. Second. A motion and a second. Did you have comment that you wanted to offer relative to the motion? Uh, or? No, I just, should, should I add the word two handholds, holes, handholds, because that's... I think being more specific. It's best. just plural. You've done that, yeah. yeah. So I think but that's other than that, I'm... Uh, Two handholds. Right. Any other questions or comments? Ms. Brewer. We had better maps this time. Thank you for whoever worked with whoever <laughs> to make that happen. I really appreciate that because we have often had little tiny gray things with very unclear things, and this had all sorts of information on it, so thank you. That helps us sort of figure out where you're talking about a lot better, so we have a yeah. sense of space and scale and that sort of thing. We sometimes struggle with the more technical drawings because they're for a different purpose. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those, so that's unanimous. Thank you both very much. Appreciate Thank your time. You. Good luck with the project. Hope it stops raining soon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's gonna start snowing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, question please. I was reminded that I had forgotten to make a note of something we already made the decision so it's fine but in terms of the annual license renewals I know that we've probably just carried over what we've done before but the fourth one down the American post of the Amer the Amer uh, Amherst post one Amert post 148 <laughs> I don't care about that what I care about is the all alcohol on-premise license 
things are a little confusing when it comes to veterans clubs, but when we do our liquor license quota, we call out veterans clubs separately and we charge them a lower amount. So while it is indeed all alcohol, it is not the standard all alcohol on premise as our quota report reflects. It's a veterans club all alcohol license, which we only charge different communities charge different amounts, but we only charge 1500 for instead of 3500 for, and it doesn't impact our number of all alcohol on premises as I understand it. So just to make that clear in that last column that it's the little special kind of all alcohol license, I think that's great. And it's already clear on our liquor quota report. Great, thank you for that. So is Mr. Zomek still? <laughs> I think he's still working. <laughs> searching for the, for the uh, items relative to uh, the conservation restrictions. So I believe, um, I think the next thing we could go to in the, in the short term is um, if you want to talk about charter transition. Sure. A uh, number of things under this. The um, first, I want to recognize that these are the invitations, which you can have as many as you'd like, uh, to the event on December 2nd, which is the uh, first town council inauguration. It's the swearing-in ceremony of the town council. It's Sunday, December 2nd at 1 p.m. at the per Amherst Pelham Regional High School Auditorium. Um, it will be followed by a reception in the um, uh, cafeteria of the uh, Amherst Pelham Regional High School. That's an exciting thing that's happening. Um, I'm gonna give you a list of dates and what's happening, and then there are a couple of substantive things that uh, are before you in terms of uh, one is the Board of License Commissioner's charge, and the other is the Committee Vacancies and Appointments. So I'm just going to give you a quick update first. Um, the Council-elect will have a workshop on Thursday, uh, November 15th at 5.30 p.m. at the Student Union, uh, Cape Cod Lounge of the Student Union at the University of Massachusetts. This is their first gathering. It's, there's no decision-making happening there. Um, but the public is welcome. It's a post, we've posted it so people can participate, or not participate, they can attend and observe. Um, the, and one of the reasons we're doing it there is that there are two uh, trainers who are putting on a presentation about um, municipal board retreats on Friday, and we were able to get them to come in early and talk to this council on Thursday night. And so that's, that's the plan for that. Uh, uh, Senator, uh, former Senator Rosenberg will be sort of uh, coordinating this evening uh, to help the council uh, begin its work. The <clears throat> second um, workshop, there will be a second workshop on Thursday, November 29th at 6.30 p.m. at the Bangs Community Center. And at this workshop, the first hour, or what, I'm not sure what order it will go in, but the first hour will be the town attorney doing trainings on the open meeting law, the public records law, the state ethics um, commission, th things like that. <coughs> um, and the second hour will be a presentation by the bylaw review committee, which has been chaired by Mr. Bob Ritchie. And they will go through kind of the presentation they've already delivered to the select board, what we have done, how we've, what our task was, how we've approached it, um, what you can expect from us, that type of thing. After that, on Sunday, December 2nd, will be the inaugural um, swearing-in ceremony. And then after that, will be on the first meeting of the council, after it's been sworn in, will be on Monday, December 3rd. And the time of that, uh, sw of that first meeting will be 8 p.m. in this room, with a, crossing our fingers that all the work will be completed and we can hold it in this room. Um, so that's sort of the, the schedule of events leading up um, to December 3rd, which is the first day of the council meeting. Uh, just as part of that, um, the select board has a meeting on November 26th, which is Monday. We've also reserved a time for Saturday, December 1st, probably 5 or 5.30, in case there are last minute liquor licenses or any last minute business that you need to attend to. Hopefully it won't be anything, the meeting won't be necessary, but in case there's any last minute thing before the council gets sworn in, you'll have the ability to do to take care of that. Um, 
I can go on to the next two things, which might have more extensive discussions, unless we'd like to go back to Mr. Zomek. Mr. Zomek, are you prepared to, to go? All right, so why don't we pause yeah. there, and we'll come back and, and have Mr. Mr. Zomek take us through the two conservation restrictions acceptances that uh, are within our materials here, and, and in some ways have been, some pieces of, have, of them have been before us before, but not all of them. Them. And first, I apologize, you didn't get hard copies of this last week was kind of chaotic for us, and uh, but you got it electronically, you have hard copies on your desk tonight. Thank you so much. So thank you very much. Um, I'll try to be brief. Uh, I am here before the board tonight. Uh, to quickly review two projects that have been in the pipeline for quite some time. Um, the Hurl CR, which I believe you got copies of both the document itself as well as a map, and then a brief memo from me, is a project that the town has um, minimal um, involvement in, if you will. We are not putting any funding into this project. It has been um, uh, facilitated by the Kestrel Trust. You may recall that the town did participate uh, financially using CPA funds to preserve over 60 acres of Mr. Hurl's property on Southeast Street. This is all part of a larger block of conserved land. At that time, Mr. Hurl held out uh, a, a flag lot of just over four acres, and the Kestrel Trust has facilitated a conservation project which results in that uh, being conserved. This is all being done uh, through the state. Uh, it is, I would call it a formality, if you will, that the town is being asked to approve um, the conservation restriction. Uh, in effect, this will conserve this land so that it is preserved in perpetuity to be added to the agricultural purposes of this larger farm block. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. Um, I could, yeah, questions, if there are any. Does the board have questions relative to this particular property? I will say that in looking through our materials, the, this drawing, Exhibit B at the back end of this, is sort of the mirror image of what's on the screen as far as north, south, east, west. So the flag lot in this drawing, I'm holding it upside down now, is, is that would, as you look at it normally, toward the bottom of the, the larger piece, but it's the same piece of property that's identified there on the screen above us. So again, the town has no financial involvement in this project. Um, it will, in effect, make make sure that the conservation restriction itself is geared toward agriculture. Often conservation, conservation restrictions are not. This one really complements the APR land around it. Would you, would you like to do these as a pair? Would you like me to describe the other one or would you like to? I'd say, why don't you describe the other one? Because we'll need motion language on both. Which I, I apologize, you did not see motion language. I think um, I have consulted with Sharin Everett and we have motion language to share with you in just a moment. Okay. Again, fairly straightforward. Right. So why don't you take us through the, uh, the Epstein properties? Um, a little bit smaller, but that's all right. Um, so again, the, the board is very familiar with the Epstein property. And the project, again, the town participated in this with CPA funds. Uh, the result will be a, a conservation project protecting 28 uh, plus acres around the Epstein Pond with the Kestrel Trust owning the land uh, that is remaining. This is one of the last steps in this project. If CPA funds are used to protect a piece of property, whether it be an APR agricultural block or in this case a conservation uh, property, then uh, the town, even though we are the owners of the property 
and we, uh, the land is managed under the care and control of the Conservation Commission, there must be a third party essentially watching the town to make sure that we adhere to the conservation purposes of the acquisition. In this case, our partner, the Kestrel Trust, has been doing this since the CPA um, came into effect in 2002, 2003. So uh, we've done this a number of times. I'm going to say maybe eight uh, those properties that we've purchased. Kestrel holds a conservation restriction in perpetuity um, and do, does annual um, visits to the property to make sure that we are managing it the way we said we would manage it. So that is essentially uh, the second property. And as I said, this is the final step in this. We turn this all in and then um, magically we get a, a, a reimbursement because we actually expend the funds to purchase the property. We get a reimbursement for the amount of money between the purchase price and what we are leaving on the table uh, in CPA dollars. So um, this is all part of our work to make sure that the accounting department uh, keeps us keeps us honest in all this. So, if I could, I have motion language that I could hand to the to Mr. Yeah. Steinberg. Yeah. As Questions. you did, I. Uh, of course, there's this. Oh, thank you. There's this odd slice that is in the middle of the property. Um, that's not part of the <coughs> transaction that... Are you talking about this? Yes. Yes. <coughs> um, to remind us on what that is reserved for, by whom, and second question is, since it um, means that uh, there's not a conservation restriction on the land bordering the pond for a large eastern section, are there any concerns about the preservation of the pond? So it's a very good question. There is a three acre exclusion on the frontage on Bay Road that was purchased by the Kestrel Trust as part of this project. They are going to take up to two years to do their due diligence to see if they would like to site their permanent office building there and education and outreach uh, programming there. Uh, they're doing their due diligence now. They've had architects look at it, landscape architects look at it, and their executive director, Kristen DeBoer, and, and her staff will be looking at that. Um, if they deem it not feasible to uh, site there, then they will sell the property. Now, um, Mr. Steinberg, Mr. Steinberg's question is, is, is a valid one. There is no conservation restriction on that property. However, we own and control the eastern edge of the pond and everything to the west and everything to the to the south and everything to the east so if Castrol decides to sell somebody could have a wonderful property there and they will have some rights on our pond they could paddle there with a kayak they could fish there they could enjoy a picnic there um, but they really can't do anything to the town's property i would i would see that akin to uh, Mr. Sharkin's property on Puffer's Pond, if you will. If Kestrel decides not to pursue their office there, um, then it will be sold. But again, the land all around it is permanently protected. So it, clearly, if Kestrel wasn't there, we would have to perhaps keep a closer eye on it, if you will, because it would be in private hands. But I see it very similarly to uh, the one property on Puffer's Pond. Actually, there's two properties on Puffer's Pond that have private access to a public pond. So I think it's very similar. Other questions for Mr. Zomek relative to these two conservation restrictions? If not, then certainly the uh, motion language could be, uh, could be undertaken at this point. I think instead of vote two, it would be move to approve the conservation or would it be accept? No, it is approve. It is approve, okay. And the second one is specifically to grant. Okay. The, the, the difference here also in, in MGL is um, one has to do specifically, uh, the hurl has to do 31, 32, and 33 of MGL uh, chapter 84 has to do specifically with conservation restrictions. And then the, the, the Epstein is actually um, specific to the CPA language, 12A, 
40, in 44B is specific to the CPA language. Great. Thank you for that clarification. Someone want to offer a motion or a pair of motions, I should say? You want to go? <laughs> okay, I, I, I move to approve a conservation restriction on approximately 4.1346 acres of land at 908 Southeast Street owned by James W. Hurl pursuant to sections 31, 32, and 33 of Chapter 184 of Massachusetts General Laws and described in Exhibit A and shown in copy the copy of a recorded survey exhibit B in book 11464 um, page 99 in the Hampshire Registry of Deeds is there a second is there further discussion hearing none all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed so that's unanimous before we go on just to make sure um, I just wanted to exhibit A. Should we say the exhibit A to what? Or just exhibit, leave it as is? Yeah. So I believe the exhibit A is on page 13. It says exhibit A is a description of the premises, which is attached to as the last page of the conservation restriction. That's in your, that was in your, on your desk. And then Exhibit B is a reduced copy of recorded plan of the premises, which I don't think you have a copy of. Is that res do you? Oh, you do have it. This one's Epstein, but I think, let me look at the other. <coughs> oh, no, no, it's, it's there. It's just in a different. This is Epstein still. Yes, but, but the actual conservation restriction itself would contain Exhibit A and B, correct? Yeah, which you is, should. Which is what's referenced by. You should have page 19, approval. which is Exhibit B. Yeah. Page 19. We don't have page 19. We have 18. So. Okay. I think it's uh, yeah. fine. That clarifies. Great. Yes, Ms. Speaking Brewer. of clarifying, and I'm sorry if I spit this out, um, why don't. I understand we do what KP law tells us to do, that part I get, but why doesn't it say Valley Land Fund anywhere in our motion? Um, Whereas the approval of the select board says it's to Valley Land, the thing we're signing later tonight says Valley Land right, Fund in it. That's a very good it. question. Um, Valley Land Fund, Valley Land Fund merged with the Kestrel Trust. Um, doesn't mention Kestrel either for that matter. It doesn't mention anybody. It's an excellent question. Valley Land Fund is now part of the Kestrel Land Trust, but a separate LLC. So I guess I have two questions. One is, is it good enough? And two, if the if the part where, that we actually signed tonight is one of these, and it says Valley Land Fund, it, is that going to be problematical oh, yeah. for anybody? I mean, I'm less concerned about it matching, but I'm more concerned about saying, oh, actually, you need to sign a different one, because this one says Valley Land Fund. No, I would propose a change. But neither is it mentioned in the motion, actually. So we have a couple different issues on the table. One is if we need to change the motion, and the other is, is it acceptable to sign the thing that says Valley Land Fund? Because that's the actual thing with our signatures. Hi. Please. So, so the, the actual conservation restriction is to Valley Land Fund, Inc. So that's with all the language in the actual conservation restriction itself. And that's why that document, which will be signed, Matches is consistent. Yeah, I don't. Uh, right. Yeah, I, I, th I still think we're okay on Hurl. I think we're okay. Your, your 
That is my, I just want to make You're sure. You're moving so. to approve a conservation restriction on the acres that are owned by Mr. Hurl, um, pursuant to section 31, 32, right. and 33. Um, I should have been more specific. So earlier, Kestrel is involved. They are orchestrating this. They are facilitating this. When they merged with the Valley Land Fund, they retained uh, a relationship with, my understanding is an LLC, which is Valley Land Fund. In this case, Valley Land Fund is um, the grantee, if you will. So, so, so they are going to be the party um, actually watching over, if you will, the CR with the town. Is that clear? So, yes and no. In that I'm fine with it being Valley Land Fund instead of Kestrel, but what this says that I'm going to sign later tonight is that we approved the words including Valley Land Fund, that we did not just say that it will be done under Mass General Law and we don't care who the partner is. It specifically says we voted to say Valley Land Fund was the partner and we didn't vote to say Valley Land Fund was mm -hmm. the partner. You so, voted to approve a conservation restriction that you were presented with. Yeah. Right, but this says we voted, this is the thing we're actually signing and this says we voted to approve the conservation restriction from James Hurl to the Valley Land Fund we did not vote that. We voted the wording that talks about this. I'm just uneasy. I don't know if we attach that to it or what, but. I was just on the phone to Sharin Everett moments ago. If, if the board would like to add the Valley Land Fund into this motion, I think that would be fine. Um, that, that's what I mean. So the signature page. Uh, he's talking about the motion right now. Right. So if we, if I understand this correctly, if we change the motion that we already unanimously <laughs> passed to add the words Valley Land Fund to reflect what it says here, which is the thing we're actually going to sign, because we're not sending them this. We're not actually sending these words in. We're sending <coughs> these words away with our signature on them. This piece of paper is just a piece of paper. Yes. You're, I'm a little confused. You're this voting. This is what I signed tonight. Right, you're voting to sign a conservation restriction, so. whether it's to the Kestrel Trust or the Valley Land Fund, if the board would like to add the Kestrel Trust. I mean, excuse no. me, the Valley Land Fund, that's fine. I think, no, I think what the, the goal is to bring consistency to the board's motion to what they're signing. And I think to do that after the word on the motion after after the word hurl, if you add to the Valley Land Fund Incorporated, because um, pursuant to that would work, because that tracks the what the board is asked, being asked to sign tonight. Yeah. Exactly, because otherwise, if we sign this. I am not signing a truthful statement because I did not vote on a motion that included the words Valley Land Fund. I want to vote on a motion that includes the words Valley Land Fund so I can sign this and I will have done so. That's what I want. I want, I want my signature to mean that I actually did that thing. That's, that's fine. There's only one exhibit referenced and that is Valley Land Fund and, and Hurl, but that's fine. On exhibit B, it's on the back of the memo from Mr. Zomek. There's page 19 that has the actual picture <coughs> of the property that's not on the back of the actual full document itself. So, so. would the board accept that language from Mr. Bach? They already voted, so you'll have to re vote. Or yeah, I. Right. Uh, so, we need the motion. How do we want to do this? So, uh, we could formally reconsider it and have a vote to reconsider and then take up a new motion or. I move that we reconsider. Uh, the conservation restriction motions. Is there a second? Sure, second. Right. Why not? I assume this part doesn't need <laughs> discussion. <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. So now we're back to before. <laughs> so we could take a modification of that motion at this point, which I presume is, is a friendly amendment to, uh, to the motion that that the uh, motioner would, would accept, which was to well, it's include. Not a, yeah, it's not an amendment, because it's a new motion now. 
Right, because when you reconsider something, you kind of land fund incorporate it mm -hmm. after the word hurl. Right. Say that one more time. I'm sorry. So I think the the language would be. Um, vote to approve a conservation restriction on approximately 4.1346 acres of land <coughs> at 908 Southeast Street owned by James W. Hurl to the Valley Land Fund Incorporated um, pursuant to sections 31, 32, and 33 of the chapter 184 of MGL and described in Exhibit A and shown in the copy of a recorded survey in Exhibit B in Book 11464, page 99 in the Hampshire Registry of Deeds. So moved. Second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So we tidied up the language just a smidge there. <coughs> so Hurlstead. And so. So just to clarify, the Epstein is the town of Amherst granting a conservation restriction to the Kestrel Trust on property we own. We want to start this one with a move to have the town of Amherst grant a conversation, you know, something like that. So if we could just take a minute to read what it is that we're allegedly signing <laughs> in on page 14 of the Epstein piece maybe it tracks more closely to the motion that was provided to us. No, not really. Not actually at all. Um, and like I said, I don't really have a problem if we said see attached, but what I do have a problem with is this piece of paper goes into our minutes and this piece of paper gets mailed away and they don't have anything to do with each other or they, they aren't completely connected to each other. So in an ideal world, KP Law would have given you all this language and it would be on page 14 already. And that's what we would be voting. That just didn't, doesn't always happen. So I think what we would do is we'd move, uh, that the town of Amherst grant a conservation restriction to the Kestrel Land Trust on approximately 28.1 acres of land, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know if we need to reference the town meeting action, but it wouldn't hurt. So we could say pursuant to town meeting action of April 32, you know, et cetera, et cetera, at the beginning. Town I, meeting vote is attached to the conservation restriction. I mean, I think, oh. Yes, please. I mean, you may just, I mean, Try to track the language in the conser actual conservation and just make that the motion because that's what they're yep. signing. And it should have everything. If they've, it's been looked at by a dozen attorneys, I'm sure, by now. Except it's not as detailed, is it? Exactly. That's the odd thing. If the board is more comfortable making a motion out of what's <coughs> on page 14, that's less specific than what is on the motion sheet. That, that is correct. And if, if, if what, I understand that KP Law wants this and I wanna do what they want us to do. It's just that when I sign this, again, I'm not, they're not the same thing. And so this isn't getting attached, so it doesn't really matter what this says if I'm signing a piece of paper over here that doesn't include this language. So if this language is important, it should be the thing I'm actually signing. So I don't know if we just tack it on. I mean, somebody writes it in there. I mean, I don't really care how um, we do it. I think it, it, this is a different one in that the other one, we could just change our motion so that somebody could connect the dots between the two. This one, if she really wants this level of detail in here, it's not there. So if I could explain, I mean, page 14 is standard language in any conservation restriction done in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. That's why it doesn't include specific language about the parcels, about, about the book and page. So what we typically do is we would attach the select board's approved minutes and the motion to the conservation restriction and send that as a package for our reimbursement. I, I've never not had the Commonwealth accept that um, 
as long as there is consistency between the vote you take and page 14, which is you signing saying, yes, we do accept and approve of this conservation restriction on this piece of property in South Amherst, uh, you know, with the specific language. So I still think the motion, again, I've never had one of these rejected because it contained more specificity. What I would maybe suggest, just to sort of blend those a bit, is that we could move pursuant to the authority granted to the select board by the vote taken under Article 12B of the April 30th, 2018 annual town meeting that the grant, town grant a conservation restriction to the Kestrel Land Trust, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it sort of captures the, how we got the authority to do this. This is what I was suggesting there, but I don't know if that satisfies sort of the two pieces of the puzzle we're trying to stick together here or not. That would work. Yeah, I guess I I've personally am not troubled by the language that was provided by KP Law because I think that between the town meeting vote, which is a matter of public record and the document itself that they all are consistent with the motion our authority and our action are implicit in documents that exist and I think are, um, the reference to the authority is only needed if somebody challenges the authority and that's clearly covered and uh, as far as the authorization as the document itself, the restriction, uh, it's covered by the restriction that was drafted that we're signing. So I guess I'm a little, you know, I wouldn't be um, offended by a change, but I don't think it's necessary. I do see this one as slightly different as you've indicated. These are somewhat different programs and what the first one was that concerned me is it said at a meeting duly held the select board voted to do a certain thing we had not voted to do a certain thing we had voted to do most of that thing we had not included valley land fund the phrasing is different on page 14 for this one and given the level of detail you want over here and given the level of detail that's in here i guess i, I don't feel the same way about it because it's not phrased that way in this thing that we're signing mm -hmm. in this thing that we're signing i think it's more evident that there's something else out there somewhere <laughs> that has it and as you've indicated you will put it all together so mm -hmm. because there's a lot of content that we'd have to shift between the two if we wanted to actually make the motion be perfect so i guess i'm not as worried about this one for the reasons mr steinberg outlined I want to read the motion as written and see if we can get it passed. I move to grant a conservation restriction to the Kestrel Land Trust on approximately 28.1 acres of land owned by the town of Amherst and located on Bay Road, parcels <coughs> 25B-21, 25B-25, and 25B-59 described in Exhibit A and Exhibit B in Book 13077, page 217 in the Hampshire Registry of Deeds, meeting in the requirement, uh, excuse me, uh, meeting the requirements of Section 12A of Massachusetts General Law 44B. We have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, Thank you very much. I, I promise not to bring either one of these back to you. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. Ever again. Ever. You've only got Done. a few weeks anyway. <laughs> so the opportunity Ever is want to see it again. minimal. But thank you for that. So we've taken care of those couple of items and so I believe at this point certainly not meeting on December 1st for this clear the other topics under the uh, charter transition sure. topics for future mm -hmm. council that section there. so um so, thank you Mr. <clears throat> I'll give you a couple other um verbal things and then we can go to the documents so the bylaw review committee has been meeting uh, regularly. They met 
uh, with Ms. Brewer and Mr. Rosenberg to go through some uh, detailed things. Uh, they met this morning and they will meet again next Tuesday at 9.30 a.m. They continue to work on pretty much finalize the document that, that migrates the bylaws for the zoning bylaw and the um, general bylaw into a new format for the council to adopt that would address the issues with the bylaw says, for instance, town meeting, where does that go? Does that go to the council? Use, typically, that's usually what happens. So they have a roadmap that they describe in great detail to you, and we'll provide even more detail to the uh, council, I'm sure. Um, one of those things is the, um, they, one, I think the approach that they're taking is to say, take this document, rescind everything else, and substitute this. And I think that's, it's, they're doing a wholesale change. Uh, and that's what they're recommending instead of going through, uh, you know, a hundred uh, individual changes. Um, <coughs> in order to do that for the zoning bylaw, they have to, to change the zoning bylaw, you need a recommendation from the planning board. So the planning board has advertised a public hearing for November 28th um, to move that document to the planning board, they can initiate it themselves, or the select board can vote to give it to the planning board, which is what the bylaw review committee is going to ask you to do on November 26th. I'm giving, they don't have anything to give you yet, um, but they know that the deadline to get you something is next Tuesday. Because of the holiday, we're gonna get the packet, the packet has to go out earlier. So um, that's their intention, so they would hand it to you. You would say, thank you, we refer this to the, to the planning board. Planning board has its hearing on, on, on Wednesday, the 20, I'm getting the dates wrong, whatever it is, the 28th, I think it is. Um, and then they um, will make a recommendation to the council. That's the way I'm, under, and this is in reference to, uh, Mr. Ritchie has been having conversations with Joel Bard about how to facilitate this. So they will give you more detail. I want to give you a heads up that this will be on your agenda on the 26th. Um, the other thing that, the, the other document that they're putting together, uh, two other things. One is a, a recommended uh, rules um, uh, to, to um, I forget what they call it, uh, rules and procedures. They're recommending that the council adopt as temporary rules and procedures, uh, Robert's Rules of Order, 11th edition, plus a number of other things. And one of the things I wanna make sure they include is the remote participation policy or that, the, that the select board has already done, that they just transmit that to the, um, to, to the council in, in, as a piece, maybe update where, it's, where it says select board, change it to council, so the council is ready to handle request for remote participation, which they're gonna get on, get very quickly, I think, into their term. So they have a system in place. And I, I'm trying to think if there's anything else they should be clearly taking on. So if there are other things like that that you think of, please let me know or Jeff Kravitz know. Um, the last thing that they're trying to put together is, um, we, they don't have a name for it yet. They, they, they were calling it the town code, but in one place, something that incorporates the town charter the general bylaws, the zoning bylaws, and all the all the um, accepted statutes, uh, all the policies um, that have been adopted, and then all the regulations that go with anything. Just so people can, in one place online, people can find everything they will possibly need in order to understand how the government works. They're not going to have that incomplete, but uh, completely com uh, completed by the time they. Tr hand off the document, but that's their, their goal is to help encapsulate all the laws that anybody would possibly, <coughs> possibly need to know. So that's one of the tasks that, that they've undertaken. So that's the bylaw review committee, and so it's been a good committee. They're, they're very active, and, uh, and Jeff Kravitz has done a tremendous job of serving them. 
associated with that. So um, don't don't be fooled. I didn't see anything detailed while I was there. <laughs> we were talking more about general concepts. But um, I assume that while they're talking, the one of their projects, the one you spoke of last, was associated with basically putting everything in one place. Which wouldn't that have been amazing to have for the since 1954? But um, great. So, but the Board of Health make sure that they're thinking mm -hmm. of putting because the because nobody nobody many people don't realize they need to go off and look over there too mm -hmm. because it's a separate place the next item uh, in the part of the transition is the one of the first committees that needs to be appointed is the board of license commissioners um, and in your in your packet I believe um, or somewhere as a draft charge <clears throat> for the Board of License Commissioners. And this is something that um, we sort of took a shot at and um, tried to leave it flexible, but it, it allowed um, for us to begin advertising um, for, the, for license commissioners. So I welcome any comments or suggestions on this. And, the, and just to give some context, <clears throat> this, so this is a board that takes on, by definition, the common victuallers licenses, and, and this is in the charter, and the liquor licenses. Uh, we have, we would move that function from the mezzanine, which is the town manager's office, to inspection services, the second floor, which is, does all the permitting for everything else anyway. Um, Rob Mora would be the lead person that would serve the, uh, in, the, uh, license the board of license commissioners we have posted an internal posting and have uh, a we have an empty slot on the inspection services uh, floor. Uh, Stephen McCarthy has been uh, selected from three internal candidates to uh, take on that that position. So that's sort of, and he will be responsible for helping the commission getting all the material that's needed. And I think he's really quite capable. We have three really strong candidates for that position, internal posting. Um, and they all could have done it, and it was, but they recommended that Mr. McCarthy receive this to do this job. So did, did you have a comment relative to the charge? Oh, plenty. I but bet. I was going to wait and see if anybody else wanted to go first. <laughs> more like um, I'm responding to the consolidation of all licenses and permits down here. Any thought about the physical space? People, I'm thinking people queuing up because that's you're sort of funneling um, a lot of things to what mm -hmm. sometimes already gets clogged up, and um, there isn't really any seating there. There's the bench, but if you're sitting on the bench, you can't tell if mm -hmm. it's your well, turn you know, to go up. Turn. So I'm wondering if there's a way to make it more user friendly. That's a good idea. We'll, we'll look at that and probably try to put more things online for people. They don't have to come in for things. That's a good point. Other people who want to offer comment on the on the charge there. What Ms. kind Moore? of sign do we want to buy? The flashing one that says "Now Serving." <laughs> you take a ticket. <laughs> and it can you can see it outside. And it can run it twenty-four can hours. Flashing if it's one outside, of those right? Thing that vibrates in your pocket so you can right. go away for ten minutes, get right. caught. Pager. That's an even better idea. I like that a lot. So, I don't know how much of this. There's a time sensitivity here, obviously, but I don't know how much detail you guys want to hear about this, but why don't I take a stab at it and see where we're going? So one is I do not understand why we would refer to review and issuance when it's just issue. It's not review. And that's referred to twice in both groupings. It's simply issue mm -hmm. licenses. And of course, there are renewals, and that's something else, but that's part of issuance. Mm -hmm. So I would just take that out because it, it might mean something to somebody that it doesn't actually mean. It's just issuance, like it says in the charter. In terms of, I appreciate. So just the reason for that was. Yeah. Um, I guess it doesn't make any sense. I was, I was, I was thinking, well, what if they don't issue? Like, it's like they, it's their job to issue, but that, that makes perfect sense, actually. They, don't, they can review but not issue. Yeah. Right, so yeah. just issue, and yeah. then if they decide not to issue it, then they've made an issuance decision, so to speak. <laughs> okay. um, 
I appreciate that the first grouping is, as was indicated in the charter, clearly chapters 138 and 140, and that's great. And then there's another section of things on the second page that are things that aren't under 138 mm -hmm. and 140. However, I think they're mixed together in a way that's not necessarily going to serve us particularly well. One reason is that keg licenses have had absolutely nothing to do with any body approving it. And so unless you're proposing a change to that, I don't know that that belongs in there. That's part of our bylaw that may need to be reviewed, but it's got nothing to do with these other things, even though we call them licenses, mm -hmm. right? Just to confuse things. So there's that. And then fuel storage, we do very rarely because mostly the only people who need it are UMass and we don't usually get to decide associated with them. And um, then auction, taxi, marijuana, again, all things that aren't under 138 or 140. So I get that they have to be called out somewhere because they might happen again, we may go through another taxi period, et cetera. In which case, I don't, I guess I just want to be clear that when we're not talking, we're not talking about them. Um, the town manager amending the actual permits that there's just a phrasing issue. You're talking about amending this list. This list is is the known list of things, but maybe there's something else out there that would fit in this list because it isn't under 138 or 140. And so something like not limited to or something along those lines that doesn't make it sound like you, the town manager, then go off and alter the fuel storage license, but that the list itself or, is or the it could thing just that be the alter. town council. It doesn't matter um, how we do that. The but list it, may be amended. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. What I'm saying is, yeah, it's the list that no, can yes. be amended. You can put the word which add list, which list may be amended. Yeah, something along those lines. And then for marijuana, it it's not going to be a bylaw. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a regulation. It's not, well, I assume they'll be called ordinances someday, but they're not, it's not going to be an ordinance. It's going to be a regulation to the best of our knowledge at this point. If there's a local licensing process, it wouldn't be by bylaw. So the reason, um, <clears throat> just two comments. One is, to, I just want to call out that marijuana should be, if someone's looking at applying for this, they should look at it because they it can't, be somewhere. they can't have conflicts of interest. So if you're yes. involved with marijuana, be alerted that this might pop up in, on your, on your um, radar screen. We don't know what that's gonna look like or where it's gonna live. So it could be by, in fact, by bylaw or, or some other, or other means, I guess. Except there, there isn't going to be a local licensing process that's a bylaw, just like there's not an alcohol licensing process mm -hmm. that's a bylaw. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a bylaw and it's not an ordinance, it's okay. something else. Can I have for a fix? First of all, I think on marijuana, it should have the word license added, like in so many other columns, so somebody oh, knows. Right. Um, mm -hmm. We're not talking about the whole shebang. And then it could just be parens, if enacted. If enacted. If enacted. Oh, that's a perfect. Yeah. Perfect Good. solution. We don't have to argue whether they're yep. ordinance, regulations, codes, yep. et cetera. If Wonderful. Thank you. That and solves that problem. I was going to make the same suggestion. Okay. Oh. okay. So I have two more. Let me just comment on sure. the, the fuel storage license actually is an important one. Uh, it's such a whack, you know, we have, we've had this experience where the, someone is putting in a new fuel tank and it's a slightly bigger, it's a gas station, right? They get signed off by the police chief or the fire chief, they get signed off by the building commissioner and the law requires the select board to approve it. And <clears throat> like we, this, we just came across like, what, what, you know, is this, yeah. And we had to call council, and they said, "Well, it's actually about the same size, so you don't have to really." But it was like we had never, we couldn't find anything where the select board really handled a fuel storage license, and what capacity did we have? So um, it is. I just don't want to take that off the list for that because that would be perfectly located on the second floor already. Right, and I actually do have two examples for you. Then one is the reference I made to UMass when UMass changed some things around, yep. but, but then it turned out it was one of the many things we couldn't make money off UMass for. Um, we can only do that with certain kinds of mm -hmm. inspections and others they have their own inspectors mm -hmm. for. The other one was the fuel tanks for the Sunwood development down off of Pine Street. The select board had to do something associated with the propane tanks there. Mm -hmm. And so that was a long time ago. It's in law, right. Um, but that's the last time I remember mm -hmm. doing it, but that, that it specifically occurs to me. So I appreciate that it's mm -hmm. called out, mm -hmm. but it, fortunately it's rare. 
Um, the other two comments I had were, um, you need another <laughs> You need another category, and I'm not sure if you if you stick it under the part where you've just said, since we took out keg licenses because they're not issuing those, um, if it fits under there, but it's actually not an issuance either. And that is the weirdo, bizarro thing we have that's called Kino notices. All oh, right. Mass right. General Law, you can write this down, I looked it up for you. Mass General Law, Chapter 10, Section 27A. And it actually references chapter 138. So it does tie back in that that's, that that's why a, lo a local licensing authority gets to look at the so keynote notice. Should we under the first category? But see, you don't issue keynote notices. That's the thing that's difficult, is get, that you, you get only this. get to say no, and then the state says, no, you do really want this, <laughs> is okay. the reality. You don't actually get to say no when it comes right down to it. So someplace we need to just I don't know, stuff it somewhere mm -hmm. as being a thing that's making it clear. We don't issue it, but when that notice comes in, this that should go to that body for them to decide that then for the state to decide that they're wrong, um, which luckily the state doesn't do on things like, you know, tobacco and alcohol and everything else, but they do get to do it for Keno. And then the other one is to ask, and I don't know that we'll necessarily be able to do this in the charge at this point, Point. maybe it's an update to the charge under the membership I understand that the words here are taken from the Charter in terms of uh, interest directly or indirectly however given the major employers of the University of Massachusetts Hampshire College and Amherst College all of which obtain alcohol permits on a regular basis I think we need council to specify for us how close somebody can be to the food services associated with those three agencies. Because if, we're, if we'd simply be interpreting it, which I hope we wouldn't be, to say if you work for UMass, you can't be on this, that's gonna take a lot of possible people out of the pool. And so I think that it's important that KP Law come up with where they think that line should be. Is it somebody who works in food service? Maybe not, but, or where the, the spread is, and obviously, Amherst College and Hampshire College are much tinier organizations. And you know, we can see that we obviously wouldn't have <coughs> suggested that the Amherst College Food Service Manager be on the license. Like that's totally clear. But what if somebody just works in the dining hall? Right. And and might occasionally even serve as a bartender. Who knows? I mean so I just like to not not take everybody out of the population if we don't have to, just because you're talking at five five people. No, what I'm talking about is where it says shall have any financial interest directly or indirectly, which special municipal employee status aside, if I work for the Dining Commons, do I have an indirect interest in whether or not my cousin who runs the part where they have the small bars at the Fire and Arts Center that we do license after license for um, are actually approved? So I, that's why I think we have attorneys, is for things like that. But I would just hate to see us cut people completely out of, you know, all employees, period, out of that loop. Because we ob obviously already aren't having people who work in restaurants. Beyond, and that's one of the ironies to, to this, too. I mean, I appreciate you don't want to have a financial interest, but at the same time, you're kind of taking out everyone that has any expertise with it because they're not allowed to have a potential financial interest. So none of our local restaurants that have alcohol would be able to serve. Common Vicks wouldn't be able to serve, et cetera. Even if they're recusing for their own permit and their own license, they couldn't serve? Doesn't doesn't, th that's not what these words say to me. That, that's not what this says. I, I hear you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it might make sense to have a Something thing. that's more inclusive. Right. The, the difficulty with someone say, I work at a particular restaurant, if I say no to somebody else's, then they're oh. not going to be able to have a license, and I can. That helps my business out. So that's one of the reasons for. In another, that, in another community, the 
the mayor had nominated a, a lawyer who worked in a firm that represented, and they got a legal opinion saying that was fine, but the council did not like that they even worked in the law firm that represented clients, and even though that person doesn't. So there's just, you know, I think, I think they may have learned from that to make it broader than what is in the other charter that they approved. Or, or it may also be that the charter commissioners didn't truly appreciate how many people we were taking out of the pool mm -hmm. by the way we were writing it. So it may be something that needs to be revised in the future. But just to be clear that we're not keeping people out to be difficult. It's just that as it's written, we're keeping out a lot of people. And so I'd like at some point KP Law to advise you Mm -hmm. how close somebody can be to the food service within one of the organizations. I'm assuming restaurant employees automatically are just out. But does that mean UMass employees, if they're not affiliated with restaurants, right. are automatically out? So I have one question. Um, probably more than one in the end, but uh, <laughs> the... the uh, I certainly did. Uh, uh, Section 3.3C of the um, charter provides that uh, multi-member bodies shall be uh, composed of residents of the town of Amherst at the time of appointment and throughout the term of the appointment unless otherwise approved by the town council. And uh, this doesn't indicate that this particular board has to be um, residents of the town. Um, so I, I think that we, until there's council action, it does have to be members of the town, and then it depends upon what, how the council acts on it. So are you suggesting that we take that section of the charter and put it in that you have to be residents of the town to, as under the membership section, yes. who can be a member? I think that would be smart. Sure. Yes. Um, it, it's technicality, but um, why omit it from right. this Doesn't charge? Hurt. Right. Hmm? So we can just track the language exactly from the charter. Right. Yes. Yes. It's a section 3.3C. Good. That's excellent. <clears throat> that, of course, begs a question about some of the rest of the charges and whatnot you put in here. <laughs> as to this is a new one. <laughs> and whether or not there are other conflicts like that. As I know with the Ag Commission, the well, changes we made that, I don't know if that places that in conflict with 3.3C. I mean, everything's under the charter. It, right. I think we should limit right, our scope right now to this one. So this will be a, I mean, this is the opportunity to create what you want a charter, a charge to look like, charge too. To like, yeah. So yes. this is the opportunity to say we'd like a, you know, we want a format that works and makes it easy for people to read and, um, and all it has all the information on it. And so w whatever, it would be really helpful, especially with your eyes, to say, this is what I want all future charges to look like, and over time we will put all the old charges into this format. <clears throat> and if all these categories type and um, stuff that needs to be up front or not. Capitals, if you're gonna capitalize certain second words, then they should all be. Mm -hmm. Of, excuse me. I think we have a practice of dating these so we know when it was created and then right. whether it's a footer and then when it's revised to, so that it can be tracked. As, as footers? Yeah. Right. Adopted blank.
any other comments or no categories? Yeah. For the uh, license commissioner charge, yes, Ms. Brewer. Thinking more globally, associated with the template that we never really quite mm -hmm. <laughs> got finished doing, and hey, you know, now we've got new stuff. Um, I'm not thrilled with the way this, uh, the top is fine. I'm not thrilled with the section 6.3 and then purview part because some, but I can appreciate at the same time that it just, I don't know, it doesn't track very well to me, but I can appreciate that that first sentence is trying to show where did this come from? Just like the authority says up here, the reason we have this is because the charter establishes it. Some another one of these could say the authority is a, is a topic. Yeah, I, li I like I, I mean, I really like having the authority at the top. I'm just not sure that this is very authority replacement purview. purview kind of mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah, maybe repeat purview, authority. Yeah. It, yeah. Maybe just repeat authority because that's exactly. Yeah, that makes that. Okay. Yeah, that makes it track more. And they're also different, in, as we see in our packet, in terms of explanation as to why they exist and which parts at the front, like, like we've talked about with the bylaws, for example. Now the new format will be right up front. It'll say who enforces it and how much you pay. But we never thought to do that in the past. We're so. evolving. We're evolving. We are. We are blossoming and <laughs> metamorphosizing and doing all sorts of things. At this time, what did you want us to do in terms of special municipal employees since we currently can grant that status? Do you want us to just go ahead and do that? Why don't we bring, why don't I bring this back to you at your next meeting? <laughs> and all of our next meetings. Well, we got another meeting coming up. <laughs> we got <Big>. one. <laughs> well, do, do we have the authority to grant that in advance because they won't be formed? You, you'll sort of a weird sort of in-between thing. I presume we could. Yeah, because you're creating it for positions. Could we approve this as yes. amended tonight? I'm fine with that. I mean, I, if we want to re-review the changes, but with the changes that were suggested, okay. I'm happy to approve yeah, it I think so, we'll be because done. the faster you can get moving on it, yeah. the better, because uh, yeah. once the select board dissolves, you'll have no, even I guess you have the authority. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's all on him in between. Yeah. That's right. I don't want that. <laughs> you could delay as long as you feel comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> you just sit on it all you want. <laughs> Yeah. But yes, I think it would be perfectly reasonable to move to approve the draft, or to move to approve the, the charge of the Board of License Commissioners as amended. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And then there should be a second motion in which case I move to grant SME status, to special municipal employee status to the Board of License Commissioners. Is there a second? Second. So a motion and a second regarding SME status for this new board. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 So both of those votes were in the the next I am okay so the other thing is this <clears throat> uh, as you usually know under the chart of the select board is supposed to provide a list of vacancies on multiple member bodies to the town council president and the town manager what does that mean um, <clears throat> so what we've done is just give you the, the documents that you're familiar with which is a list of all committees and boards and their membership the one page list of all um, committees and boards and their vacancies and then we for the committees that have charges, we, we've made copies of all the charges, which are in various formats and configurations and uh, pretty consistent, but they're, they come in different shapes and sizes. Um, and so, so it's a product that you have to provide to the council. And so I wonder how you want to, what we can do to help with that. So the first thing I'll mention is that the ag comp charge has not been updated since we changed it okay so it needs to be just so amended to good. reflect the changes at town meeting so that's the one I know yes, right off the top exactly. but 
I'll start with Mr. Seinberg. Yeah. Um, so on the one that is entitled Town of Amherst Committees and Boards, and then we have a bunch of beginning and end dates and a bunch of end dates that are December 31st, 2018. And I actually think that that's not correct because at the May 7, 2018 Select Board meeting, we passed a motion um, that the uh, terms would continue until the person is replaced um, or reappointed uh, by the council. And uh, therefore, uh, that date is inaccurate. And I think it came to mind um, because uh, Ms. Brewer and I received a memo from a chair of one committee who is concerned about expiring uh, dates and uh, urging quick action for special needs of the committee because they wouldn't be able to meet quorum. And of course, if you took the 1231 date, that was correct, but that wasn't what we voted. I was wondering about that too, and I appreciate that somebody went to all the work of going in and changing a whole bunch of them to 1231-2018, but I wasn't, I did, I appreciate you looking up the reference because we went around and around about this mm -hmm. because we didn't want to both tie, we didn't want to either tie the town council's hands or force them into making a ton of appointments at moment one or things couldn't meet. And so then we were, depending on that idea of, until replaced, that you were allowed to continue until replaced to give people a little room, but yet give the council the ability to say goodbye and thank you for your service when necessary. I wonder if the modification to the list could be an asterisk on all the ones that say 1231 that explain that so That's that you know, sort of still keeps that as a placeholder. It's conceivable that it could end then, but you know, sort of dot, dot, dot to be continued. So we could just make a notation, an annotation for all that. The minutes have been actually adopted by us for that particular meeting, May 7, 2018, so that it can just be lifted from the minutes easily. You just annotate the words directly. You could just put that at the end with the asterisk. <laughs> That's what the oh, asterisk right. means. Or even on each page. Yeah. Matter. So I had I had one thing. Well, when I saw this in my packet, um, I know Miss. <laughs> I, I, exactly I had PTSD. <laughs> um, I was like, oh my God, it's back, um, because I and many others on this committee also who've been involved in committee appointment work. Um, this needs like continual sort of monitoring and watching and trying to update. And I, I've been away from it for a while, but when I, you know, the first one was the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust. And there's always been this confusion about, so the start date um, was when they got put on the trust, but many of them were on the prior housing committee for many, many years. So in a, I'm not always sure which counts as the start date, but it, if the council were to follow sort of a similar practice that we had of not having people serve for more than six years or something close to that, and then we did make some exceptions as well, it's, it's really hard to tell from the start dates, the begin date mm -hmm. column for the trust, if that, that these, some of these people are holdovers from the other housing committee. And, um, so I don't, I don't know how you, how to deal with that. So Greg Stutzman did not start in 2016. It's been like eight years, so it doesn't really reflect the length of tenure. Like with one candidate, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I think on Mr. Kegelman, it does list his term with the Housing Sheltering Committee in the designation. Oh, I see. But okay, not for well, others. I think the one <coughs> I want to look up, um, Stutzman and Hornick, um, are the other two that will carry it over. It's not mm -hmm. an issue. If there's more than members now. Right. It's not an issue. The other issue, if I, if I can continue, 
where it notes that uh, Mr. Slaughter is select board member, and I have the same issue myself for downtown parking working group. You know, do we as individual people decide when we step down, or do we kind of ha decide on a practice around that? Or, you know, I thought it was, it, it, because this is in front of us, it was worth discussing uh, maybe an approach if we wanted one that was consistent about that. Right, I, I've been thinking about that a little bit too. Um, partly because I think, like for example, with the Affordable Housing Trust, um, you know, that, because that has to do with adopting sort of state law and that sort of thing, I think that you know, as of the 3rd of December, I'm no longer a select board member. Mm -hmm. And so that seat is then yielded to potentially a council member effective immediately, I think. I think in that circumstance, I think in some others that we do that aren't quite as bound by state law and that sort of thing, um, we may have more latitude, I don't know, I'm not sure. I think, again, it begs the question of how should we approach some of this. I would suggest, generally, this, I mean, the simplest thing would be is that we're not select board members anymore. And right. for those seats that have that formal designation, downtown working group, uh, parking working group, um, you know, my seat on the Amherst Center Recreation Working Group, potentially. Um, I can't remember from that charge, I haven't looked it up. Uh, certainly the, the trust is one that falls into that category. Um, there's some other ones that I serve on that are not uh, as dependent. I can serve as a designee to say PVTA. So many of the people that serve that on that advisory board. That's not on here, that's a separate list right. that but, needs but to what be I'm provided. Saying is, as an example people. of you know right. things that we serve on that, are, that right. Are trust and parking the two, or are there some other sleepers in the there? recreation working group you mentioned? Recreation working group has a select board voting member. Right. Yeah, it would it would be helpful to me to have one one kind of position and just follow that rather than me deciding when I leave a committee. Um, another alternative would be to parrot the language that we had previously discussed and said that um, and have a motion tonight that we move that. Um, in any designation where some where a member of the select board is currently serving on a committee because of the requirement that it be filled by a member of the select board that that member shall continue to serve until replaced by the town council or the member's resignation we pass that motion that would allow um, in case of the housing trust, for example, Mr. Slaughter to continue to serve, which gives them one more point of flexibility for getting to a quorum, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. And um, it doesn't take anything away from the council because the council, if there's a council member who's very interested in serving on the housing trust and wants to jump in immediately, uh, and that's what the council decides, so what the council decides. Well, they, they're scheduling, they're trying to schedule a meeting for the 6th, so if on the 3rd they decide to appoint them, that's the case. But anyway, separate from that. Um, I presume if we had the authority, we potentially could have that motion? Yes, Ms. Grewer. I, I like that motion a lot, and it, reflecting what you mentioned earlier about Amherst Center Recreation Working Group, if we had we almost have page numbers. Yes, we do. Page one um, at the bottom is where it should have said select board member under designation for you, Mr. Slaughter. Mm -hmm. um, it just doesn't because we do that sometimes. Um, but those do seem to be the only ones because we made a point of not several years ago. We took JCPC off of here. We took BCG off of here because those were not things we were appointing as our authority we didn't carry school committee on here the reason those is because those were members that were then sorted amongst each of the bodies but they're not they're specifically not listed on here for a reason in terms of 
you may have put the charge in here, but they're definitely not listed on the committees and boards for that purpose. So once you know BCG wants to start meeting, then it's going to have to either let some select board members come, or it's going to have sent some town council people. So can't hold up school committee library trustees, but then there's the finance part of it too. So a little more complicated, but I like the language that you have as the carryover. Again, it leaves the council a little more wiggle room in terms of how quickly they have to do things. And I think I can guarantee that they will not be making appointments on December 3rd at 8 o'clock at night. It seems highly unlikely that that's going to be on the agenda. But I, I'm trying to figure out, it's, it's, it, it definitely is the downtown parking working group. The Amherst Center Recreation Working Group, if you look at the charge, it doesn't, I mean, it's a town manager appointment. But I don't think there's anything. I don't think we called it out. I think it's just that <clears throat> Mr. Slaughter was interested, but right. But but but, but it's he not. Was, he's not there not because of his as a select board member. He is there as, an he is there as a select board member, though. Yeah. In all reality, no. Oh, he's a select board member who happens. Oh, it does to say select board. Does say select board. I'm sorry. Uh oh. It does say select. So it, that would have, that would have, that would apply. Right. All right. I was wrong. He just didn't let us argue about it because he wanted it. So it's all good. Um, so that is designated. All right, I'll just try this one more time. I'm, I'm kind of uncomfortable with this carryover. It may help the committees, but I still think it's awkward for the council to um, sort of, okay, you know, Connie, your time's up now. We've got somebody. Maybe we could have a finite limit. Like, yes, hold over, but only until March or something. I, I'm just... I'm on that committee because I'm on this board. And whether I would be on it if I were a citizen who was just <coughs> interested, I don't know, just something awkward in that open-ended continuing from this board. Well, I think also the other thing when, we, when we've, and we've done it very rarely, but when we put a select board member on a particular body, it was with the very specific intent of bringing that, that. You know, viewpoint and, in some senses, authority or perspective, mm -hmm. specifically. And yes. when we're not serving in that role anymore, then we don't have that. You know, um, so that's the thing I've been thinking about: is that well, I'm you know well versed in the topics and the groups that I'm in, but at the same time, I don't carry the same uh, you know authority or or perspective even once once December third rolls around. Um, and so I think you know it. It would be, uh, I think, wise to, to to be limited in that regard, and uh, you know, the sooner the better, to be honest. But so for housing trust, <clears throat> that's a nine-member board with only one vacancy. So if you vacated, they would still be above quorum plus they one. They have so much trouble getting quorum if they only have one vacancy. Because they made the committee too big. That's not our problem. So in terms of the December 31 t date, what the charter says is the terms of all members of appointed multiple member bodies shall continue for the balance of the terms for which they were appointed unless otherwise provided for by this charter upon the expiration of the term of office or upon an earlier vacancy in any multiple member body, a successor shall be appointed as provided in section blah, blah, blah. Um, we read that when we were working yeah. on this. We did that on purpose. We did December 31 on purpose. No, we mm -hmm. did. The language until replaced or reappointed by the town council or the member's but resignation. That's, that was already voted or not. We voted, we voted in we May voted to do that. something that's slightly not comporting with that. Okay. So to give, to allow for flexibility because that did not yeah. because what that said basically was that put us in the position the way it's written in the charter put us in the position trying to recall this whole conversation but put us in the position of saying oh well then should we give somebody another three-year term but then right. the council's got them for three years when they might not even want to have that committee anymore and that starts getting all kinds of awkward so i appreciate that on the one hand the charter said we're not going to kick everybody out we also said, well, we don't want to re-up people for a whole long time because you might want to feel like you have some flexibility to change things around. And it feels more flexible if you haven't just reappointed everyone for three years. 
So everyone, just to be clear, because I'm just kind of catching up with you guys, any, anything that says 1231.18 will have an asterisk by that in accordance with your May 7th, 2018 yes. vote that says you will continue until it's replaced. Unless you quit, right. Yeah. Okay. And some may want to quit, but. So maybe so, we so should have that after our name. So, we what, but no, I think that what the problem is is that this is a different classification. It's um, people who are serving on something because they were, we designated that a select board member should serve, and we really want to cut that off, which I think was a point that Mr. Slaughter was making. Um, I'm going to come up with the date of February 28th because it gives essentially three months because December 3rd, I mean, it's the beginning of December, so that's December, January, February. The motion that I would offer, um, and I'll read it now, but I'm not offering it until there's agreement to this uh, or some consensus, would be moved that um, when a select board member is serving on a multi-member body as a member of the select board, that member shall serve until the earliest of replacement by the town council, the member's resignation, or February 28, 2019. It still lets people quit. It lets people oh, yeah, quit, but people always can do that. And you know, if, yeah. if any member, any of us who serves in that capacity feels uncomfortable continuing to serve or unable to serve, then they should have that right, of course. You can't tell somebody they can't resign. <laughs> called, you can't leave called, until called, February 28th. <laughs> it's called involuntary servitude. I think there's a constitutional amendment 14th, that think, dealt right? with that one. Um, I, I would second Andy's motion. Do you want to offer that as a motion? Yes, I offer that as a motion, and I can Second. give wording to wonderful. the town manager as I've as they're floppily written it out. So it gives us a specific end date and requires some action, but three months. Right. Resign, but it gives us a graceful exit. Right. Resign, resign. Right. Well, and certainly, you know, I think in particular with with the thing I've think, been thinking about is that there is some. Um, need to uh, transmit some of the information to the new person and from the viewpoint of a select board member. So on those committees where we mm -hmm. serve in that role. Oh, if it's a council member? To the council member who takes our place, it's, it's an important uh, right. potential you know, transition element that we can offer to them if they want to take advantage of it or not. But I think it's, you know, it's valuable as far as keeping those, those committees working and, and functioning well. So I think we'd do this anyway, but I might just a reminder to myself that we I think we're the only two implicated. We could let our <laughs> committees we could let our committees know the vote tonight. You know, sure. Absolutely. Did you have another comment? Oh my gosh, I have so many comments. So <laughs> one of those comments is associated with the PBTA slot you have, for example. And we I understand why well, I assume I understand the way the charter's written to, to have this phrase, which is great. But it doesn't allow for understanding that because that isn't part of this list. So we do need a list of other things that we've been doing, and we st we started one. We had we're going to have a little purple folder for it or something. I don't know what happened. Right. But PV so the PVTA and then the MPO yep. and UTAC. PV, um, PC. That's you. Yes. So. And Campus Community Coalition, we served, but I don't know if it was by a vote to do that, but it was mentioned. Yeah, in I think that should be on the list, too. Oh, just PVTA, UTAC, CCC, PVPC, and I missed one. MPO. The, the MPO. Yeah. That kind of. Anything else that you guys serve on? I'm going to keep running that Hampshire County Select Board Association, even though we don't have a select board anymore. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we do have a motion, which is related but distinct oh, right. from that. That is so still if we, on the floor. Do we have any other?
comments are associated with that motion. With that motion. So I guess I have a question, which is, are you, given that you are the two, would you rather we pressured you to quit now, or are you willing to do it a little <laughs> bit longer? Because if you'd rather, by fiat, we decided you should quit now, oh. we can it's, help you with it that. Is good, it feels like a good compromise to have a okay. specific ending date, but not necessarily. Right. I mean, we can still resign, and we can still not right. go to meetings, so it doesn't. Right. But it kind of is a placeholder. Yeah. Right. I think it gives clarity to the the to those committees. There's a fixed horizon for for replacement for one thing, and it also does the same for the council to say, "Hey, you have to make this decision at least by this point in time." Um, and I'm, you know, happy to continue serving and or yield, depending on the council's pleasure. We have a lot of vacancies to fill because we've right. been carrying a lot of vacancies. Absolutely, yes. So there needs to be a cover memo to this cover memo to all of this that addresses that motion we just did. That 1231 thing, asterisk, we did. Right. Um, so the motion, asterisk. <coughs> this, um, this is what's going to be presented to the council. Yes, right. on top so of what, this, So basically. there'll be a cover memo from the chair. That talks about the motion from the select board about the select board positions mm -hmm. um, with the February date. Then there's also the list of other select board positions that you will not find in this report because this isn't where we manage that information. Mm -hmm. And those five agencies that were <clears throat> listed off will be in there. Mm -hmm. And then it will also have an explanation of the asterisk for the 1231, even though it's gonna be at the bottom of the page. It's worth calling out why we printed something in four point type at the bottom of the page associated with that. That'll be useful. And then a couple of other things I'd like that memo to include. One is some of these things we can fix and we won't have to put in the memo. Other thing, if, if we don't have time to fix them, then they do have to be in the memo. If there are any references, which there are currently, and we don't get a chance to pull them out, on old charges that refer to a select board action on June 15th of 1998 for SME status, that is simply to be removed, wipe that out. That is no longer in power, that, that was replaced. So it never got fixed on all those charges. There are What's some- the date again? June 15th, 1998. Okay. There was at that point, I like the word fiat tonight. There was a fiat at that point that everybody did have SME status, and then it was pulled away from everybody. Then it was applied to some, then it was it not just, applied to That has to be others. deleted from every charge. That simple sentence is supposed to be deleted, and it's just one of those things it's on, it was on Ms. Pupple's list back when she was yep. still Ms. Roussel, and we just never got time to go back and take it out from it's all of them. That does not mean other references to SME status need to be removed. Just Those that one are, date. Yeah, it's that one date. It's this one. It even references Mass General Law, and it's just wrong. It's like they pasted it on the bottom of mm -hmm. all right. these, and it's that's easy. wrong. So that, if we don't get that fixed, we mm -hmm. need to mention that, that that's not fixed. Um, so that's one. Another is that... Another thing in this memo, as we're helping people understand what this thing is, we all understand what the Town of Amherst Committees and Boards chart looks like because we've all suffered through it at some point or another. But it needs to be made clear to the council that those acronyms at the beginning of those are meaningless. Those acronyms were simply for the purpose of a database at some point. Uh -huh. ACRWG <laughs> is not necessarily a thing. ACC is not necessarily a thing. They are not <coughs> accurate acronyms. And so, you know, you don't have to take them off. It's just that those aren't the, those aren't the real acronyms for things because they were just made over time so that something would fit on a chart. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. The concept of town code is meaningless. And so some of these old charges still reference town code. Now, that might become a new thing, but the problem is, for example, La Paz Centro says town code 19. Well, yeah, no, that's not a thing. What it probably meant, probably, at some point, was the fact that we have, I think, I said yesterday three, and it's actually at least four types of committees. We have Mass General Law. We have town bylaws that have established committees, like Human Rights Commission, that's not a Mass General Law thing, but as a... We have town meeting action committees that did not establish bylaws, but created committees like La Paz Centro, which is probably not a bylaw, but is a town meeting action. 
And then we have, as I wrote here, made it up, <laughs> which would be you know, Water Supply Protection Committee, for example, when the town manager decided they needed one of those. So there's town manager committees. And there's select board committees. Select board, so there's two more categories. So they're, they're the made it up category and that they're not related to mass general law, to a town bylaw, or to actual town meeting action. And one of the projects a million years ago was gonna to be to make sure we sorted that out when we were talking about making a template, because like I said, you look at La Paz, it says town code 19. That might even be referencing that there was a town meeting article about it at some point, but we obviously do not at this very moment have anything called a town code and have not had such a thing, although maybe someday that's what it's gonna be called. Um, so if the bylaw review committee <clears throat> wants to have one of their people who's now so familiar literally with all the pages of our bylaw sit down for a minute and look at these that sure. might not be a good a bad idea because they're way more familiar with our town bylaws than we are at this point the town code has to refer to something well at some point it did that's why I'm saying maybe it's town meeting action Finance committee board of assessors they all have a town code of some sort yeah Finance so, committees under the Town Government Act. So Town Code 14. I'm not sure what that reference is. So I guess the question is, do you want to have revised, and I'm not sure if this is, we have the capacity to do this in the time remaining, to change all the committee charges and bring them back to the board? No. I'm saying that's what the cover memo is for. So the cover memo covers all those issues. It says we have five different kinds of committees yeah. if you're counting them made it up as one category. Yeah. And, um, and that, in fact, town code is not, because what I'm, all I'm trying to avoid is giving this to the council and them thinking it means something. It mm -hmm. doesn't. It might have meant something to somebody at some point that then helped them figure out which part of the town meeting action it was in, because I'm, I'm confident there's at least one committee we have that's based on town meeting action that's not a bylaw. But So um, the only changes we're going to make to these charges is to remove that that's the June only thing 15th, I would 90, say we really June should 15, get rid of. Because that's just, misleading it's just a flaw. to people. It's right. just a flaw. That should get rid of. But other okay. than that, I think you can just explain, hey, these have been developed <laughs> over 50 right. years. Right. Is it the They're board, not consistent. Is it the board's intention to have that be the document you want to present to the council? This cover memo with this plus the charges? Is that what and, you're and the vacancy list, the whole the thing, this, list. This, yeah. whole this whole thing, packet, the right. pieces, plus a cover memo. Cover. Right, got it. I think that'll work. And, and Mr. Wall. Similar to this, I noticed that committees are described in different ways. Like some say it'll say committee, and some will say standing. And I'm, I don't know, I'm kind of assuming they're the same thing, but I could be stupid. And other times they'll say ad hoc, other times they'll say time limited. There are at least four or five designations. Yeah. At least. Right. Just the flag in the purple folder there. Right. That's right. actually a good point, too. You could make a note. Of, that could be another note that that, that type yeah. is, it is, is a very <laughs> erratic. <laughs> erratic. Just because Let's I think put the word erratic in a memo. Standing, ad hoc, time limited. Uh, standing. One just says what type of committee, committee. Yes, that's my favorite. That's my favorite too. Yes, <laughs> the category is committee, and the, the and it is called committee. Right. Yep, erratic. Yes. So I don't know. I, yeah, so I far, it. the memo. The, the, yeah. So far, the cover, and sort of like, committee. says, you know, what what you're seeing, what's in here, what's not. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's the place. I wanted something that explained our own practice of um, incur, you know, sort of enforcing, encouraging um, two-term limits with exceptions. We, we modified our own policy. When, is like, that an actual policy? No. Well, it was our practice. practice. It's a practice. It's a and they can do whatever they want, clearly, but to just say, you know, in looking at these dates, some, you know, some members have served more than six years or two terms, and you might want to think about that or have a conversation about that. If you know, um, you know, it's all over the board because sometimes the committees really want to keep their people, and we really wanted the turnover. There's a new group coming in to do appointments, so it's just an awareness that had yep. become our practice, right. but it could be something else. Right, Mr. Steinberg, do you have something That's, you want to offer? I mean, it's going to take a little bit of time to modify the 
practices because well, most of these committees will now become town manager appointments subject to notification to the council, which will have 30 days to act upon it. If not, then they become members automatically, and the uh, council is going to need to set up a process to review that and make a decision as to whether it even wants to bring it to the council and you know how they want to handle it. So there's there, there, there's a lot of things in process. What we want to do is assist the council to have that discussion. And so as you put something in there, like we had been uh, limiting to the extent possible because uh, of these reasons, appointments to two, three year terms, uh, and, you know, it's informative, um, but uh, I think that they have a lot that it's going to be on their plate as they establish a process to deal with all of this because they'll be still reviewing all of the committee appointments recommended by the manager. Right. And, and of course, there will be a number of other committees that may be subsumed into some for form of council committee. Mm -hmm. So they may say, we need to talk about parking there's already a downtown parking working group and a transportation advisory committee, we're gonna make a council committee that has Got X parking. number of counselors yeah. on it and we're gonna invite a bunch of people that were already on those other things to help us make that transition. But instead of saying, town manager, you must appoint more members of the transportation advisory committee. So that is certainly coming. So I wonder if maybe what we want then is we want <laughs> one cover memo that has all those things about where charges come from in terms of mass general law, the fact that code is probably such an old reference, none of us can remember what it is, that acronyms aren't accurate, that our, that our type is erratic. Um, it, that's one memo. And then I think there should be a separate memo that should be probably written by one of us that says, some of the stuff about the practices that we found useful because it should the two terms part and the CAF form I think is important that that didn't just magically come out of the air that that was worked on over time and for a purpose doesn't mean it won't be changed completely but and the interview process that the, I mean those three things jump into my head is like if you don't know those things about how we got to where we are then you're gonna have a harder time even beginning to struggle with what committees need to exist Reminds me about the whole uh, database issue. Like we hate the CAF, but we were we we failed at changing it because it was so linked to the way the fields are set up, and that whole effort be, sort of ended up for naught. So that's still out there. I might want to, for informative purposes, say yes. the technology behind all this is like a major part of select board work. It's so I can work with the chair on that first memo that you described. Who's going to take right. on that second memo? So I think. With regard to that, and just a reminder, everybody, we do have a motion on the floor. Um, but I think on the second part, that actually bleeds into a, a conversation we've been having over the last several months of, of you know, making that much, you know, much like Mr. Hackenbleckner did for you, made a sort of list of things to keep an eye on. This could fall into that category. This is an area where we have a much more extensive or expansive bit of writing to do. Um, and I had fully intended and yet failed to do that for this meeting, but certainly will before our next meeting try to compile that list because I've got a series of notes where I've made uh, notes about things we want to share with, with the council. Um, and this topic I think has come up more than once in varying forms. So I, I think in some ways that could be part and parcel okay. of that. So you're saying so you're going to do that. So I could take that on okay. as far as a... Fair enough. Yeah. Just so it's in somebody's... I'm, 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 I'm down with that. <laughs> I don't want it buried in with all the other things that we're never going to have time to flush out. I want this one flushed out. So can we at least get well, this, this one flushed out? Well, this can be absolutely much, much longer. And then you I can just say the other ones I don't have time to write about. <laughs> well, well, no, the <laughs> rest of them may be just bullet points. This one may be like a page. And, It'll you know. have a subtitle in bold and a whole paragraph or something. Right. So this one could be much lengthier, obviously, because it has a lot more to it um, than the other ones, which are more, you know, maybe just informative of here's another thing you should kind of notice that you should need to take attention, you know, pay attention to, or here's, here's a reference that you'll want to have. Um, you know, it may be as simple as a link to, you know, action we took, to, you know, a year or two ago on some particular topic. So it could be, some things may be literally one line and others obviously like this would be much more extensive. So um, 
anyway, so I, I think that we're a little late, but nonetheless, or I'm a little late in putting that together, but certainly want to put that together for us and, and have that for the council because um, congratulations to the two of you, but also there's 11 more who haven't done this before. And uh, so we so, have a draft to review prior to our last meeting on the 26th. Exactly. Okay, holding you to it. That's right. Yeah. So no jinxing involved, but when you break your hand coaching, then this part needs to be written about the committees, even season. if nothing season else program. gets done. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, Dragon right. speaking naturally. Football season ended deals. on Friday, so you're good. All right, so we're good. <laughs> so, so we're so, good. So barring Because there's a whole bunch of things, but this one, since we just focused on it, right. I think it no, would be absolutely. incredibly helpful because it's something they're going to have to start yeah. eating away at the edges of right. fairly quickly. Absolutely. There's no doubt. There's a, there's a fairly large chunk of work to be done here. The, the other part that I wanted to follow up on is you mentioned we were saying, you know, the only thing to go in and fix on the actual charges because we don't have time and although if the bylaw review wanted to take a quick look at some of them that might be helpful but we could just ask them to do that whenever, whatever you think works for that I don't but think we have time. if they have so much on their they plate have one meeting left. okay if they only have one meeting left then that's cool but the other thing well maybe the council will assign it to the next version of the bylaw review committee to actually dig some of these up but the other part of it is because I'm really not going to spend that much time on Google on the old town meeting actions at this point because that's pretty hard to Google results from. But at any rate, is you specifically mentioned AgCom hasn't been updated, so we should not give them that without it being fixed. Update that company, and yes. the other one is Public Shade Tree hasn't been updated either. Right. And so um, I realize that the regulation thing is on my plate, but the charge itself says there's not a town bylaw associated with it, and in fact there is. So we just we have to do something. That. And we do have one other thing, which is the request from La Paz Centro to dissolve. That's true. I believe that's coming up in six months, if I recall correctly. It's been a while, but uh, we should check back with the committee chair Ms. Stanek and ask, but I, they are very firm that they want to dissolve, and it was tied to um, the um, final um, grants that they're going to make to the town of La Paz Centro, which will dissolve the fund that we have been caring for them. They have not been raising any new money, and uh, at that point, the committee does intend to dissolve. Is requested to. So back to our motion for a moment. <laughs> is there further discussion on the motion, which term limits? It was so long Ms. ago. Miss no Kruger and I, but it was anymore. you know the 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 conversation was was uh, was important to have in in regard to the other related topics. So, any further discussion? This remind me of the motion we're voting on. <laughs> uh, I think Andy so the, Andy, the Andy's motion. That's okay, Andy's that's relative to okay. Yes. We'll resign. Be replaced or be replaced by the end of February. Yeah. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And that's unanimous. Great. Excellent. <coughs> I have homework that I actually might be able to get done because I'm not spending quite as much time winning football games. Yeah, we did win on Friday. That was nice. Well, see, you were going to make a grid for us. Then we were each going to have to write pieces. And so it's worked out super well for us that you just have to do all of it now. <laughs> He's so guilty because he didn't do it yet. Um, yes. Along those same lines. Your problem. In your pa on your desk tonight is a resignation letter from Mr. Shriver, um, who says, I am resigning from the planning board of, on December 2nd, 2018. It has been an honor to serve with the wonderful volunteers and staff of the planning department for almost 10 years. I look forward to the next three-year adventure. Sincerely, Stephen D. Schreiber. So the challenge, the, uh, for the council, the, the planning board gets reduced from nine to seven members on December 3rd. Um, and so this brings us down to eight members on the planning board on December 3rd. And for the Zoning Board of Appeals, it moves from three to five members. And so the, early on, the, the council will have to address the two who, who will move up, either from associates or pro appoint new people. It's up to the council to appoint the ZBA. Who's off the island? Hmm? Who's, who's off the island? That's right. I, Mr. Schreiber, the Okay. We do. 
a lapel pin, just like, wait, wait, don't tell me. Just as a note to the manager, I have in conversation with a couple of members of the council elect, um, I don't know that there's wide understanding that there are associate members mm -hmm. currently of the ZBA and uh, good to give some wider knowledge somehow on that topic. Along those lines, is this is current then because in fact they're short a full member right now, so they've been having associate fill in because they haven't had a full board. Member. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. According to this. Yeah. And so um, the other part of it is because depending on the year and depending on everyone's schedules, sometimes associates have had very little opportunity to actually serve, and so they might not necessarily say, oh, yes, I can't wait to be full member. They might say, I I've never actually been, except to an administrative yeah. meeting. They've, they've been serving now because, so, we because, because we've been short somebody. More of them have been in. But we went through a period where associates were not able to serve very often. And that might have worked out great for their schedule, but it also meant they weren't necessarily oh. interested in becoming full members. So the point of like informing the council, educating them, the ZBA associate member is a pretty unique situation, and they have to sit for the whole thing. They don't just come in dirt when someone can't be there, and we don't have that for any other board or committee. So it's not like, oh, the ZBA, why don't we do that for this committee or that committee? This is a real special case for a special reason. So um, I guess they could create it down the road, but we have not wanted to do that. It's the only board that's a quasi-judicial board in the town, so it does have special standing. Yeah. Because they're time. Yeah. But, but the charter doesn't have associate members for the CBA. Well, it's going to change. Oh, right. You're right. It's going to change. It just change. becomes the. Uh, right. What you say is members. totally valid because right. people should not misapply it to another situation. It's going to change. It was, it was a time. very yeah, specific right. situation. Yeah. Yeah. And, okay, and do not make assumptions that it would be a really cool thing to apply Our to thing others. Is it was there. Um, you, to get an affirming vote, you needed all three to vote in your favor, and so that will be different with the five-member board. All right. Oh, yes, thank you. So moving on in our agenda to the town manager report. Okay. So first, apologize for not getting this to you. I think what we can do is, if you haven't had time to read it, which I assume you have not, uh, we can also I will put it back in the packet on for the November 26th meeting. Um, number of things. Uh, we talked about the health insurance, which is a good news story, and we're really happy, and the employees are happy um, that we will not be taking money out of their paychecks, or we have suspended that. Um, there will be a cup of joe uh, with Brianna Sunred, who is the new communications manager for the town, on Friday from 8 to 10. Is it 8 to 10.30, I think, 8.30 to 10, um, at the um, Ulver building at UMass. We had been asked to hold one of these things at UMass, and this is a great opportunity. She's uh, a part of the school public policy program. Uh, they have um, talked it up at the university. It also coincides with several things that are happening at the university this week, which includes the um, Mass Municipal Management Association Conference, the, um, uh, what is it called? elected leaders or ELGI meeting uh, and then there's the women in government meeting all happening at the same time <clears throat> so uh, it's a it's a busy day at UMass and also very proud that the town is now part of a um, partnership with UMass and the International City Management Association to have a student chapter at UMass so those are all very good things um, in your packet, you, and I wrote in it, there is the new alliance between the Jones Library and the Friends of the Jones Library to coordinate their fundraising, and the actual agreement is in your packet. Um, there is one, the sculptures, I believe, are all removed at this point the, from the Crosstown Cult, Culture XTCA. Um, there's one sculpture that's still in Kendrick Park. We're um, negotiating with the owner of that sculpture to keep it for one more year with a defined uh, termination. So once we get all the liability issues and all those things worked out, we'll be good to go with that. Um, the um, 
town clerk and her whole staff worked really hard to conduct two elections uh, on election day and pulled them off successfully. Um, we learned a lot. She has a lot of ideas after going through this process about polling locations, how she wants to set it up, how she wants to staff it going forward, how to publicize things. And I think with a new council, they'll all have ex a direct experience with the election process and will have I their own ideas. Um, as part of that process, the town clerk is having debriefing meetings with all of the wardens to find out what worked, what didn't work in your particular warden. Um, you know, one idea she has already surfaced with me is maybe we should be making greater use of town existing town staff so there aren't as many um, people calling in sick. You depend a lot on people to come in. This isn't uh, and just show up on that day. And um, this is an unusual election because there's two elections. It'll never happen again because from now on, all local elections will always be in the odd numbered years and all state and federal elections will always be in the even numbered years. Um, so this was one of those oddball things, but we will have more elections coming up and she wants to get it right. Um, let's see. The half marathon that went on uh, Sunday. Sunday, no, was it Sunday, a week ago, um, went off successfully. Um, it, was, uh, it was unfortunately on homecoming um, weekend for, you, for the university and I talked with the owner of one of the establishments at, in, in Cushman and asked if it really was helping his business or hurting it. He said it doesn't help it and they were busy. He says, but homecoming is one of their biggest weekends of the year. So I think in all, in future um, scheduling, we should avoid homecoming because that's an important day for a lot of businesses and to disrupt traffic a little bit um, was a little bit problematic for them. Um, the um, congratulations to LSSC for its 50th anniversary Halloween Fest, which went out. They had hundreds of kids downtown. They thought about almost 500 uh, people downtown for this event and was a really important thing. Um, talk about that. The um, wanted to announce in your packet is a memo from the group that we set up to review marijuana licenses, request for recreational retail marijuana licenses. And um, just to give a little background on that, they were, we received. Um, we put out basically an RFP uh, for who wanted to open up a retail, uh, which is recreational marijuana sh store um, in the town. There were six responses that were um, received. They went to a town review team that included um, the um, building commissioner, the fire chief, um, let's see who else was on it. Police, I'm oh, sorry, Pla planning chief, the planning director, the health director, economic development director, and Ms. Kruger from the select board. And they interviewed all, you, you may want to talk about, it, about this. One withdrew. Withdrew. And uh, came back with a recommendation of three that we should pursue with a host community agreement. So uh, that, the host community, the draft host community agreement was finalized on Friday and went out to all of the um, prospect, prospective um, applicants. So the goal on that is to get that um, wrapped up and get those host community agreement signed so they can move forward to the state, which is what the, that's the thing they need to do for the state. So the reason we're all looking confused is you emailed us that report, but it's not on our desk tonight. So we have your town manager report, but we don't have the additional attachment that you provided us. It wasn't email. attached to the town manager's report? Okay, that's my bad. I it's can. just, but that that's why we were like, going like this, like, we know we've seen it. Where is it? We, it's not in our packet. It was emailed to it was yes. emailed to us. It was, it was not in our email. physical packet. It was not on our desk tonight, but we did read it in email because we do. We just jump and read your emails as soon as they come in, no matter what. But it wasn't we'll, in the PDF. That's what that was. I emailed out last the, night. No, it was in the P. It was not in on there. your desk. Though. It's not in our desk. Ah, it's not it. in my our bad. hard okay, copy. We have nothing fault. to look yeah. at. So what I'm saying is, could we make sure that it gets, I'd like it to be separated from the town manager's yeah. report when it gets uploaded mm -hmm. so that people can easily find it. Because right. that right. was a very useful yeah. thing, uh, thing that you just told to us that mm -hmm. you had previously emailed us. Okay. So, but we don't want it buried at the end of the town manager report. Right. If you could 
just well, upload everything it on the town manager report. None of it's buried. It's very important. But if you read the entire town manager report. Um, what are the things? So let's see. Um, oh, uh, we are going to we're going to start alerting people that it's supposed to snow on Thursday night. I don't think we're going to need a snow ban, but we're using this as an opportunity to start alerting people that we do have snow bans that do come come up, and using the next day or two to start to send out alerts saying, pay attention to the weather. If it's a snow ban, the blue lights will blink. We have a whole protocol of things that we do. It probably won't be needed because I don't think the weather's going to be that bad, but we thought this was a good opportunity, especially before Thanksgiving, to say these things happen. If you're going to go away for Thanksgiving, think about where your car is, things like that. So you'll see some notice about that, and you'll say it's not going to snow that badly. But this is more of a, a practice to help people, under, remind people that winter's here, be prepared. Um, let's see. Uh, update on Station Road bridge replacement. Uh, so, so far, what we have, a, as you all know, we had a uh, public meeting that was very, very well attended at the Fort River School, uh, seems like maybe two weeks ago. Um, and we have a, have a web presence you know, with, the, um, with a bunch of material on it, memos, and a frequently asked questions memo that tried to address many of the questions. Um, as of today, what the superintendent has said is what has already happened is that the wetlands delineation um, has been completed. The delineations determine the presence, location, and physical limits of wetlands and surface water in accordance with local, state, and federal methods. We've also completed the survey work, which is the field work that collects physical information such as wetland, flagging, existing utilities, pavement, bridge structures, significant trees, and other drainage structures. So that is done. What's going on right now is the existing condition plan is being prepared, which we think that will be in mid-December. Uh, this step takes the wetland delineation and survey field work, which is now completed, and prepares an existing conditions base map used in the design process to determine impacts of the proposed plan. Um, we're preparing the Mass Department of Transportation Municipal Small Bridge Program application, which that may be done this week. Um, this is, the, this is how we apply for funds, uh, for state funds to, for the bridge replacement. And then we're working on the design of a replacement bridge, which is we expect a 10% design, which is the first step to be done in January. This is the analysis that will develop the basic bridge replacement concept for permanent and temporary structures. So we're moving forward on both permanent and temporary because if, we, if, if we're, we're gonna have to make a decision at some point that says, well, we can do a temporary, but that means you know permanent replacement is extended out. Maybe if we um, are a little bit, we are, keep the bridge closed a little bit longer, we can get the permanent bridge done right away without doing the temporary. So there's going to be a decision point. All the work that's being done now is going to be needed for whether we do temporary or permanent, no matter what, all the wetlands work and all that kind of stuff. Um, <coughs> the... Um, Geotechnical borings. This is the actual collection of subsurface material that is analyzed to develop the foundation for any new structure. That's scheduled to be done on December 1. And the um, DOT will begin review of, this, of our small bridge application as soon as we submit it. So I'll upla upload this to the website. So everybody in send will keep people noted, uh, up to date on um, what's going on in this because I know this is a hot button issue and very important to people um, because it inf infringes on their daily lives so we're going to continue to work on this going forward um, let's see so on the station road bridge on the station no sorry puffers pond um, we are now going into the permitting process for that conservation has determined that that um, hammerhead thing is probably going to need some permitting through conservation, so they're beginning that process. And so it won't infringe on us being able to get this done in a timely manner, but it is another step we have to go through uh, for that. Um, Groff Park, we went out for bids. The bids came in too high, and so we didn't have enough money to do it. So. 
Um, we are looking at doing two things. One is, and we, we went out to bid at a certain time of year where we were worried about uh, companies feeling like they had too much work and they were going to up the price. We will go out to bid again in January when maybe the work, people have more time to focus on their bids. Um, and we may be um, value engineering the, the design of Groff Park to see if everything is there is, is really needed or not. Um, yeah. How big a spread was there? I don't know the number. Is, uh, it, no, it, it was like 20%. So, yeah. Um, let's see. The other, um, I want to mention some personnel things. I mentioned that Brianna Sunred has taken on the new title of communications manager. Um, uh, Jennifer LaFountain has taken on the, the title of acting collector and we'll get that as, as a, we went through the tr uh, personnel board and they will, they had to create a new slot for her. So she will be the actual collector and that was a good promotion. Um, I mentioned the administrative assistant in the licensing commission. We are now, um, we have a job offer out for a shared customer service person. So if you recall when we um, outsourced the ambulance billing, it meant there was a person in the treasurer's office who that function was no longer needed. That person applied for and got a position on the second floor, but her, 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 her seat on the first floor was never filled. And that has created a, a, a problem on the first floor. At the same time, uh, Leisure Services lost a, their, front, their, first, uh, their front desk person who retired. And so instead of giving Leisure Services a full-time person, we determined that what would be better is to take that, that slot and divide it so half time on the first floor here and half time at Leisure Services. Not strictly half time, but when Leisure Services are really busy, they'll spend more time down there. When we're really busy at, on the first floor here, they'll spend more time down here. And the idea on this was also to try to diversify our language capacity in the town hall and at leisure services. And I think we, if we get the person we want, that we will have accomplished that. And then a piece of not such good news is that Captain Jen Gunderson, not good news for us, but good news for Captain Gunderson, was, um, w was appointed as the new police chief in the town of South Hadley. And that builds on a, um, a history of the town of creating chiefs. And there are about, you know, we have a list of about 12 chiefs that have come out of this department. Um, <coughs> it's a, losing Captain Gunderson is a great loss for the town. She was um, clearly a strong leader inside the department and in the community. She did a lot of work with the uh, university, which was really important work. Um, she she got Amherst. I mean, she was, had deep roots in Amherst um, uh, through her family, and um, just was the epitome of a good police officer. So, South Hadley, congratulations, um, good for you. Um, but the good thing for the town of Amherst is that there's a lot of great um, police officers in our department who are in the leadership uh, stream who will be able to step up and fill that vacancy. So congratulations, we're really sad to lose her, but um, she'll still be in the neighborhood. Um, and then the last thing I want to mention was about, you know, you all heard about the fire at the Ann Whalen Apartments uh, last Thursday morning. And um, that, uh, um, you, you know, I get a, I got a call early in the morning on that, and typically when I get a call about a fire, I go down there and I sort of pay attention to the firefighters, and they are doing a great work, job, and I sort of acknowledge that, and then there's nothing to do. But in this case, we had 60 or 70 um, uh, all different aged people coming from Ann Whaling Apartments who um, had been rousted out of their beds and came to the um, bang center um, in their pajamas and bathrobes and uh, with hardly anything because they had to get out of the building right away. The firefighters responded incredibly quickly and got the, fi got the fire out with minimal damage. Uh, police officers helped, went door to door um, to get uh, residents out. Um, and then we at four in the morning, we had lots of people in uh, sitting in a dark room <laughs> at, the, at the bank center. And so, you know, 
with a few phone calls, you know, town staff were just pouring in uh, a, a phone call to the university, and they, as soon as they opened up their kitchen, they baked a bunch of, of um, baked goods for the residents and shipped it over to to us. Um, and because it's at five in the morning, none of this, none of our normal stores are open yet, and um, and you know the the senior, you know. The, senior, the director of senior services was there, the health director, the assistant town manager, everybody came in instantaneously and started working the phones, the, the, the um, facilities people, um, getting the building opened up, getting the heat turned on, um, getting coffee made for folks, all those things. And, and so everybody chipped in. You know, I don't need to go through all the litany of everybody who helped because it was, there was supposed to be a council on aging meeting. The, those volunteers came in and started helping serving coffee and stuff to folks and sitting with them and helping to entertain them. IT brought a TV over. Everybody's chipping in to help keep them in. But, you know, I just wanted to say that the real heroes were the residents of Ann Whalen because they were the nicest people and really inconvenienced. They're sitting in chairs like these for, you know, at first we thought it was going to be four or six hours, but it turned, to be long, turned out to be longer than that. And there were no real complaints. They weren't happy, of course, but... These are people who were mainly concerned about getting their medications, um, getting their clothes, uh, getting their pets, and taking care of their pets. And um, the firefighters, police officers, and town staff were just great at sort of accommodating them as best as possible, but they couldn't go back in the building. Um, but these residents um, were patient, they were appreciative. Um, when they heard news that they liked, there was applause at one point. And it was the least entitled group I'd ever seen who deserved so much. They were like, you gave me a bottle of water and a granola bar. That's so nice of you. It's like, you know, these guys are sitting there in these chairs. And it was just really wonderful to see. And it made us, um, for many who work for the town, it said it was, they felt like it was the best day they worked for the town. It sounds terrible to say during a tragedy like this, but they felt that it was such a rewarding day to work for the town because everybody was pitching in together and the residents who they were serving were so appreciative of anything that was done. So just want to thank the town staff, all the volunteers who came through, the businesses who contributed food, um, Whole Foods, you know, um, Pita Pockets brought over a bunch of, everybody was jumping in and saying, what do you need? We'll, we'll bring things over. So it was a um, tragic day for the town, but um, a great response. And it also taught us a lot. Um, <coughs> the poor housing authority director was on her fourth day on the job and um, had, you know, and get helping the housing authority um, get organized. Um, the, the inspections office, which is something I learned was that a lot of times this happens to your house or your business and you don't know who to call at five in the morning. And, and our inspection staff can't tell you what company to use, but they say, here's what, here are the things you need to do. You need to get a company to come and start doing cleanup. He said, are there companies out there? Yes, there are. Here's how you find out about them. Here's the next thing you need to do. They're, so they provide direction and guidance, which is what people need, because a lot of times these things, especially in private homes, you get just people hear about the fire and they show up and offer you their insurance services and stuff. So people need a trusted face to help get people back into their apartments. Um, so uh, a lot of um, support from people. Um, there's been a, um, a fair amount of um, post-event counseling that the um, social workers at, at uh, Senior Center are offering. And, um, and, and so it's, it's just uh, some people are just very nervous about going into their homes now because they've experienced the fire and that happens to you. You get nervous overnight. Um, so help, helping them su survive that is, re is really important. Um, so we, we've done a term I hadn't heard before, a hot wash, which is what you, it's just basically a debrief or after action analysis. We did that um, internally and learned, learned a lot and also know what we need to do. And um, so just as a follow-up, we had already planned a, a, a tabletop exercise for emergency planning in January or February. And for this event, we were fortunate to have the Bang Center handy, but 
we kept thinking, what if this happened at Colonial Village or at the Boulders or someplace and we had 100 people that had to be housed in the middle, middle of winter, what would we do? And that's the kind of exercise we need to go through. You know, what are the facilities that are available? What vehicles are available? How would we transport people in a heartbeat? Um, who, and, and do we have everybody's phone numbers? Is that up to date? Um, so, and uh, we're gonna have a debrief with the Housing Authority staff as well. Uh, so we're all sharing the same kinds of information. So it was really uh, an important day and um, just, but overall the message is to thank the residents of Ann Whalen um, for being so gracious and understanding of uh, and appreciative of how we were trying to get them back into their homes. If I may just yeah. jump on that for a second. Um, I was at the end, uh, at the bank center probably a little after seven o'clock that morning and saw staff, um, you know, in action. And it's, uh, it's phenomenal to see, you know, we, we know we have great staff, but uh, to see them sort of fully engaged in all of their different roles and responsibilities. And it really had, you know, sort of top to bottom and, uh, you know, people involved because fire was involved, police was involved, inspection service was involved, senior center was involved, uh, uh, health director was involved, assistant down manager was involved, you know, so all of those people are involved in ways and, and constructive and, and, you know, part of why we love to live in this town, mm -hmm. you know, it's because we've got people like that, that that do phenomenal work for us. Yeah, and the Red Cross, I forgot to mention the Red Cross, and they were helping to get people, uh, we were driving people at 5.30, the social workers and Jen Reynolds, and, and driving people at 5.30, get them into motels, getting them vouchers, um, and then they had to find some a, a motel that would take pets because someone had their pet. So it was just they were they were really well organized and um, it was really good. So I think that's my um, Ms. Kerr. Did you want to mention the sad outcome of that fire? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, the the woman whose apartment where the fire started uh, did not survive. She had very serious burns. Was um, taken immediately to Bay State, which did not, not Coley Dickinson Bay State, and then from there they couldn't handle the, or they, they chose to seek, um, they bed flighted her to Boston for cert. And it, we knew early on that the first few days were gonna be very touch and go, and she was, wasn't able to survive, unfortunately. Any other aspects to your report? Are you gonna talk about, okay. okay. Um, so now we'll move on to, to member reports. I have one, but I want to give an opportunity to the others to mention anything they have. Yes, I just wanted to have a, a follow-up quick to um, something that was in the town manager report, which was associated with the bid ban shell. Yes. I would just like us to continually make it clear that when we don't say anything in the really great descriptive paragraph about how it's not a done deal, people assume it's a done deal. Mm. And going and looking at it in library is awesome, and people voting and getting excited about it is awesome, but it has a whole lot of other steps to go through, none of, you know, right. which, which right. has a ways to go. People and might so, be looking at this for the first time and not get that, you know, yeah. new counselors or something. So just yeah. To, yeah. to emphasize, remind, remembering that lots of people don't know anything about the process up to this point, but they see that over in the library, they're gonna say, yeah. oh, they're building a band shell, <laughs> period. That'd be helpful, thanks. Mr. Steimer. Just since we're following up on the town manager report, just another quick thing. Uh, uh, I, think, I think it's great that we have this plan for Thursday to notify people to be aware of what our policy is when it snows and parking. Um, one place we might contact um, is the off-campus housing office at the university because uh, they may have email mm -hmm. links to mm -hmm. a number of student renters and that actually is a frequent source of problems that I've observed. Great. Mr. Wall? Since somebody mentioned Ben Shell. <coughs> <laughs> so the, the jury, sorry, the jury has met and uh, made a decision as to a favored design. I shouldn't call it prefer preferred concept. Um, <laughs> and the next day then the examples, the full range went up in the library. So just to, to clarify and to amplify what Ms. Brewer said, um, the choice of the design that will be pursued with the person who submitted it 
is up to the jury, not the public. The public is expressing its reaction to these things, which will be taken into account and will be in honor for anybody who was uh, so favored. But that has nothing to do with what actually happens. And as far as what actually happens, again, to follow up Ms. Brewer, you know, the bid has a very small amount of money. The bid specs, the, first of all, order doesn't matter. It's a conceptual design. It's not, you know, it's not fully engineered. It's just a very beginning idea of what something might like, uh, might look like in that place. And the amount of money the bid has is very small. And the specifications given to those who submitted designs uh, specified $250,000 as the price range. And that might not even cover things. So there's a long gap between a few tens of thousands of dollars here and $250,000 and approval and everything. So it's good to make that clear that the idea is to spark interest in the site and what we can do for a heavily used and beloved piece of town property, but nothing is happening anytime soon. Um, so the thing at the library with the voting, I glanced at it, was that like faux voting? Because that's not really going to decide the preferred choice. I, I wouldn't call it faux. I, I <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that implies it, it, choice. something dishonest. But um, no, I did bring up the question at, at one of the meetings of the jury, and I think the idea was that we want people to take a look at it. And that there's an honor in having people express uh, a preference or some kind of approval for something they see. It's just separate from the process. But that was an issue to think about. So it should be clear that it's really a way of honoring the designs in yet another way. And getting a sense of what the public thinks too. So, it is faux. It's just not spurious. <laughs> <laughs> Are there other member reports? I do have one, but I want to make sure other people have an opportunity to share. <laughs> it's not a member report, but after we're done, I do have one additional item before we adjourn. Okay, it won't be long. All right, so a couple of things that I have. Um, first thing I'll mention is the Puerto Rican Heritage Day celebration, which is this coming Monday, I believe, um, which will be at 11 o'clock in this room, correct? If well, it's they're supposed, not under construction. It's, it's supposed to be outside, and they're prepared to hand, have it outside. Um, I think we surprised them by thinking that we're going to have a meeting in here tonight, so there's a lot of cleaning that went on before you came in. Uh, so we'll see what condition the building is. In. Right. So we'll hopefully have it outside. Hopefully it'll be about 55 degrees and sunny, and we'll be able to have it outside. And the organizers know that. Oh, and right. they do know that. And, and I will be able to attend that because I'll be here for agenda setting either just before or just after. I can't remember which. And so I'll come and, and, and be available to be at that. So I did want to make that the, available to the public at large to know that that event's coming up um, next Monday at 11 o'clock. Um, Second thing, and I sent this uh, in an email to I CC the group, the uh, select board on this, um, was relative to the uh, PVTA funding. Um, we've had some conversations with the folks at PVTA uh, relative to restoration of some routes. Um, and long story short is that because we cannot guarantee uh, continued funding to support those routes in, in, in the future, um, that sort of restoring them and then taking it away, that inconsistency is really uh, problematic in a lot of ways for the, for the, for the transit authority. Um, and so uh, the decision that, that we went with was to not do anything at this point as far as using that funding to, to restore routes. The routes that I think they're hearing the most about as far as reductions um, are not ones that we can really very well uh, Uh, support because it's a lot of mileage that's not in town and so that gets into a strange place as far as some of the the legality of it and and some of that sort of thing so it, it, it's a difficult circumstance it's not a, a pleasant place to be as far as not being able to 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 do that I do want to mention however though but that the kinds of of reductions in service that were under consideration when town meeting met versus what actually got applied were much much different the actual reductions that were put in place were far less um, about probably a sixth of the size of the reductions that were originally considered. I may have the math off a little bit on that. I'm doing it quickly in my head. But it was originally a $3.1 million, and it ended up being around 700000 So 
maybe a quarter. Um, but nonetheless, it was a much, so, so I think if those reductions had been more severe, then I think the urgency for us to utilize that money to, to do some restorations might be a little greater. But again, we'd be in the same place um, with regard to sort of putting service back and then taking back away a few months later. Um, and I, that doesn't bode well in the long term. What I do think has come out of this series of conversations, though, is uh, we've connected with with the university about this topic of funding, and, and uh, we'll do a similar outreach with Five Colleges, Inc., I think. And I think our resolve to uh, essentially lobby um, our legislators and the legislature in general to support the, re the regional transit authorities is something that is of uh, significant importance. And that's something I want to convey uh, to the council. Um, but also, I think that we should you know, sort of continue the momentum we have by virtue of having some, some meetings with some folks at, at the university to, to really strategize on how we can best uh, you know, have an impact on that, on, that, on that funding that the legislature undertakes starting in January. So I think that's a, a positive uh, that's coming out of this. Um, I think there are some other PBTA related things relative to routes that run into the big Y parking lot or not. It's interesting, uh, some back and forth that's going on there. The, the landlord had wanted them to, to not pull into the lot. Uh, I think a number of riders had, had you know, uh, expressed concern about that and the difficulty that it posed. I think uh, some of the businesses that are in there have, have reached out to PBTA and said, hey, you got to come back into this. So I think they're in a state of, of review regarding that. I mean, I think from a, uh, from a purely driving a bus standpoint, it's a difficult parking lot, but I think we'd all agree it's a difficult parking lot regardless of what kind of vehicle you drive. Um, but I will uh, be at PBTA on Wednesday, and so I, which is tomorrow. I'll be there tomorrow. Um, so I'll convey the, you know, that that we definitely support, you know, what's best for for the riders and the needs that they have, and so um, we'll try to, you know, uh, be supportive of of the needs that they have to to get to the services that they need, because that particular route that runs through there is is actually called the Shoppers Shuttle. So you know, one of its intentions is to get people to the grocery stores and not just one of them. So um, I think that that, you know intention behind that route needs to be, uh, you know, uh, that we need to, you know, provide our support for that. And so it, it may be difficult for PVTA as far as drivers are concerned, but I think they've done it and so they can continue to do it. But we'll, I'll see what the situation is relative to that and report back, but I'll certainly convey our, our uh, you know, support of the riders and, and, their, and their needs. Um, I'm trying to think if there was any other thing I wanted to mention or if I certainly can answer questions I'm about on, PVTA thing. So um, go ahead. Maybe it'll remind you. Um, so one of the things I hope that when you're working with UMass and the five colleges as we continue, come, and as we have done in the past, but perhaps do even more effectively in terms of lobbying legislators, to remind them that there are people that we've gotten letters from that said they can't get to work now. Right. And so I understand that one route in particular that I'm recalling from an email, we can't, about ensure that mileage is out of town but we don't seem to be able to, you know, a logical person might say, well, why can't we shift it into Amherst funding and they shift Amherst funding over here so that people can get to work. And so I realize that frequently there's, you know, two or three people this affects, but it's a huge impact on their livelihood. And so to remember to be able to provide those letters, for example, when you're talking with legislators that you, you know, oh, well, it's not got a very high ridership. Well, that person no longer gets to work. And so that, that, that's a really big impact as opposed to it's inconvenient for me to wait an extra 15 minutes kind of thing. Right. I, th I think that the, the points I have made and will continue to make relative to this is that, you know, people make decisions about where to live based mm -hmm. on, right. you know, the, the ability and the availability of the public transportation. When it changes, it, it puts them in a bind. And so I also make the argument the, that the dollars spent on that public transportation are very high leverage. In other words, when you think about having an impact on citizens of the Commonwealth in a very direct way, these dollars really do. And when you look at PVTA in general, I don't know about you know the other RTs as much, you look at the ridership and who is affected by that. We have a lot of people of lesser means that are affected very negatively. And so that's again why it's a, it's a high value return on, on investment there, I think. Um, the other thing I think about as far as you know, a strategy with regard to, you know, the university draws students from across the Commonwealth. And so in a sense, 
they can speak to all the legislators because their constituents are affected by these bus routes not existing or existing or to what extent they do. Um, and it makes it, you know, we talk about people being able to get to work or not. It also makes a difference about whether people can um, go to school or not because if the finances of, of their living circumstances have changed significantly enough that, you know, the bus doesn't run so they didn't have the car, that's a whole level of expense that, that may not fit into their financial plan as far as how they're going to school. So it, it, it's a multi-layered, uh, you know, impact when you start to change these sort of things. So I think those are all cases to be made relative to, to better and consistent funding for, for those RTAs. Thank you, I think that's really important. And the other thing you'd mentioned that possibly we'd look at funding for sort of dovetails with the big why conversation, and I appreciate that we're taking that on, is also the shelters discussion. Right, and we, I think we said, well, maybe if we can't use the money over here, Right, and the fortunate thing with regard to just shelters is that if they have, they have some capital resources set aside for shelters, and so if they have some in stock and we have a location, if we can provide essentially the concrete pad, they can oftentimes provide the shelter if it's appropriate, you know, appropriately sited in an appropriate location. They try to put them in places where it makes the most sense as far as providing you know, uh, relief to the riders and, and that sort of thing. Um, so certainly, you know, and last I checked, which was a few weeks ago, relative to the shelter question, they did still have some in stock. You know, they buy them in sort of blocks of, I don't know, 20 or 50 or 100, I'm not sure off the top of my head. But, you know, they buy a set, you know, a number of them. Um, they still had some. And so uh, if we find, whether it be for that particular route or some other route that we, we think that, oh, a shelter would be really a, a good thing here, there's potential to, at a fairly low cost to us, uh, be able to, to to provide that accommodation and they're you know willing to work with us on those kinds of things so then my point would be if you would make a note of that for your successor absolutely <laughs> which may be well be the town manager but right. that 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 should continue to be discussed mm -hmm. whether it be there on that shoppers route or right. somewhere else right absolutely so are there other member reports if not, Mr. Steinberg, you had something well, to say? Well, yeah, the, the, the question that I had has to do with minutes. And um, there are a couple of uh, things. One is, is that we are um, still lacking some minutes that need approval. And I know if we have only one scheduled meeting left, um, it's my understanding that there's a bunch to come. I don't know how many the bunch is. And I don't know if I'll be able to do them all or not. It depends upon how many it is. So may need to share them um, because we need to, uh, it looks like uh, the 26th is the date to try and get that done. Mm -hmm. um, a second seven. aspect of minutes to concern about having been involved in this process of dissolving of boards and committees that dissolve is what happens to the minutes of the last substantive meeting that you have? Do you need to have one other <laughs> meeting, even if only for one minute, solely for the purpose of prov approving the minutes of that last <laughs> meeting. And um, so I don't know what we want to do because we are going to have a pretty substantive meeting at 1126 and what happens to the orphan minutes. So I just pose that question without suggesting the answer now, but I do think that it needs to be considered. And the last thing on the subject of minutes is, um, amongst other things that I noted about the minutes of May 7, it was with some great degree of embarrassment, I had to note that the section that I was reading from was in fact mistitled because it says, appointments under transition provisions of the audit. Oh. And it should have, we should have caught that when we approved those minutes because it should say of the charter. So I don't know if it's possible to um, just treat it as a Scrivener's error and have it changed online. Yes, it is. I want to get into, but um, solving the problem about the last minutes, but is it like legally possible to authorize a member to read them and review them at some future time and, and adopt them without having us to convene as a board, which because we don't exist. You don't have to ever approve minutes. I was going to say, you don't, there's oh, still Legally, there's no requirement. You just have to have them. Just have no. to put them up. Right. So. 
But we could we could designate a, a member to just to proof them for accuracy or something like that and be done with it. I seem to recall from some of our other members' DRB meetings, the practice of the staff liaison was to issue reports which were not called minutes, but presented an accurate account of the meeting. It may depend on how detailed their business is, but otherwise we'd have to have a, you know, a minute long meeting to approve the minutes, but you'd have to have another meeting to approve, to approve the those minutes. minutes. Right. 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 I, I wonder whether you could cycle. essentially have a meeting that, that you, that you yeah. wrote and recorded the minutes at the end of that meeting. It would be a little self-referential, but, well, but I don't know if that... Correct. <laughs> but anyway, that's... The only other one I would ask about, though, although like I said, I'm confident of that from reading I've done in the past that you just, you don't ever have to approve the minutes. You don't have to vote. You don't even have to accept them by consensus. They just are it's what they are. Record, yeah. um, is the other aspect though that we should double check that we've done is that we have found, that we've gone through executive session minutes. Mm -hmm. um, because there's probably a backlog a couple of town <clears throat> managers ago. Um, <coughs> that it's just worth remembering that that's still a thing out there that needs to be done. And really, that's a legal counsel question always, too, because is it something where we should still be releasing or in? Yeah, exactly. But we should put it on their plate <laughs> rather than feeling like it's still on ours. Yeah. That the minutes discussion doesn't take too many more minutes. I actually move that we adjourn. Because <laughs> <laughs> the motion is second. Any further Good discussion? Idea. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And we're adjourned at 957.